All right, fellas, let's talk about Dead Space. It's about that time. Dead Space, if you haven't been able to tell, is a very special game series to me. It comes from that lost age, that golden age, a time when games were just allowed to be simple. It's also part of a very special genre to me, a genre that is more and more misrepresented and misunderstood by your average video game journalist and video game YouTube critic. And that genre is, of course, the action horror genre. Not to be confused, even though it often is, with its older brother, the survival horror genre. Not necessarily survival horror as a genre's fault, since everyone and their grandma, including game developers, just slap survival horror on everything. But like I said in my Callisto review, typically when somebody calls something survival horror, they really just mean to say horror game as a vague blanket term. In contrast to survival horror, action horror games are typically about a character coming into danger, usually starting off from square one with absolutely little to work with, usually about one weapon or so. But over the course of the game, coming to be a real capable survivor and usually a threat or nuisance to whatever they're facing, the enemy counts are higher and so is the ammo. And these are games that are typically more combat focused. They can be scary, and they can lead into the horror side more than the action side should they so choose, but just as easily focus more on the action side of things and shift the pendulum. Less running away, less kiting around enemies, and more about fighting back. Dead Space is a third of what I consider the big three. Well, technically more like big four now that Callisto's out, but anyway, franchises that are a shining example of what these games are. Now, I've mentioned Dead Space and Callisto, but the other two examples being The Evil Within and much to the tears of survival horror fans, at least a good 60% of the Resident Evil series. The quote-unquote issue with this genre is that it's an extremely difficult balancing act to some people. Some people will play these games more for the scary stuff, and others are more interested in the overall experience and the gameplay. Couple this with the fact that horror games as a whole have an issue with lack of scares on repeated playthroughs, or the scary fading away like halfway through the game, or possibly in its sequels, and the only thing you really have left is the gameplay loop of these games to carry the longevity. This is why action horror games tend to sell pretty well, selling better than, you know, your classic survival horror style games, and tend to be the more replayed between survival horror and action horror. But as time has gone on, there's this portion of the fan base that grows to dislike the sequels of any big horror franchise for not being as scary. Often, in my opinion, because they're chasing that feeling of experiencing it for the first time again, and that tension is just never going to come back, regardless of if it's a survival horror game or an action horror game. But action horror is again able to fall back on the fun factor of just blasting away zombies and monsters and can lean on replayability, new game plus, and upgraded weapons in the way that survival horror games just aren't able to even dream of doing. Even with bonus weapons you get for completing certain challenges like infinite rocket launchers, infinite ammo machine guns, the works. You know, the kind of shit that turns it into an action game regardless, but... This again is something I'm gonna go out more in depth with when I get to the Resident Evil series. But since that series has about a bajillion games to get through, what I'm gonna do here is start with Dead Space, since it has a remake that's on the way, and a spiritual successor that was still on the horizon when I started this script, but is already out now. The Evil Within 1 and 2 will likely be the next games I talk about, since at the time of writing this there's only about two of those. Then we'll move on to Resident Evil, since that'll take ages to get through. And hell, if you guys like that, I might even analyze Silent Hill, seeing as how Silent Hill is personally the only one I've ever completed, but I did play a bit of 2 and 3. So let's get to what started it all in the Dead Space franchise, Dead Space 1. So to talk about Dead Space 1, I have to tell you guys the story of how I found it, which is very similar to the story of how I found out about Resident Evil 4. See, back when it didn't fucking cost you an arm and a leg to get a traditional printed magazine to read, 
I saw Dead Space in a Game Informer issue, and it looked a lot like what it was trying to be, which was Resident Evil 4 in space. Only not exactly, because it did look to be a bit scarier. They were always intending to make a horror game during Dead Space's development, but during the early planning stages, Resident Evil 4 came out and the whole team decided, holy shit, we have to make it play like that. So they got to work and that's exactly what they did. And that's what about it caught my attention in screenshots because it just looked so fucking cool. So from the age 12 to 14, I begged and begged and begged for this game until finally I got it for my 14th birthday. I pop it into my PS3 and nothing. See, I had this little brother that would just ruin every PS3 ever bought. Putting discs in with his, you know, cans that he'd been eating with. Ruining the lenses inside them. And because I had to share it, I didn't have a choice but to let him fuck it up. I mean, I couldn't stop him when I wasn't at the house and was at school instead. So eventually he messed up a brand new PS4 right around the time I got the copy of the game. I tried and tried for months to clean the disc reader enough to try to make this game work. Wiping it down with all kinds of stuff I wasn't supposed to even be using. I would saturate the disc in cleaning supplies and pop it in the disc reader, hoping it would try to read it and wipe it clean. Sometimes I could get through to the logos before it stopped reading the game. Other days I could even get through to the opening sequence before the lens reader would fail. And the Kelly and crew would just be floating in limbo, not speaking. But one day, out of nowhere, the disc actually did work. I was able to get through the flight, the crash, and the first big event, and finally the elevator ride. Ran to it, shut the doors, elevated started to go down, then this happened. Paused the game, took the disc out then and there, didn't even get to the door closing on whatever this was. I legit thought I had fucked up and I was too scared to see what was about to happen. So I just took that disc out. Didn't touch this game for months, about six months until I got another PS3. That was my first experience with the Dead Space franchise. Which is funny because it's pretty similar to what happened with Resident Evil 4, but that's a story for another time. Eventually I did though, which brings me here. Just as a warning, we will be spoiling the plots from beginning to end of these games as we play through them. And we will be talking about story beats freely. So be aware of that starting now. Dead Space's plot is all over the place and gets a bit complicated and hard to follow with all the lore as the games go on, so I'll be trying to explain it as I go. I'll also be referencing some events and characters from the spin-off games, the comics, and the films and novels, but we won't be deep diving into the spin-off games and reviewing and analyzing them as we will the main series. I came to that decision mostly because I like to think about the end product the consumer will get across all platforms. Like if you just casually told your girlfriend you should try Dead Space, she isn't even going to be able to play Extraction on Xbox, which is probably the most content rich experience you can get from the mainline games of the three platforms. If she was on PlayStation, she'd have to go through Sony's Asswater PS Now service to play them which wouldn't even come with the Dead Space Severed DLC. And if she's on PC, contrary to popular belief, statistically speaking, she's not gonna wanna fuck with emulation to play Extraction or something, due to it being a pain to set up an emulator if you're not really familiar with PC. Unless she emulates it, or again is on Xbox, she basically can't play Dead Space Ignition, and she can only play the Dead Space mobile game if she has both an Android phone, and knows how to mess with APKs, and downloads the very specific right one in a bowl of different ones with the sound fix properly applied. And I'm sorry, but the average person is not doing all that. This is a general rule that I follow where I don't review shit I have to go out of my way to try to fix or get working, 
but I will make certain exceptions to this rule in cases like Resident Evil where you basically don't get any sort of option to play the original trilogy outside of emulation. Dead Space starts with a ship, the USG Kellyan. En route to locate and repair the USG Ishimura, the best planet cracker in the business, which has gone dark and radio silent after putting out an SOS beacon. I do recommend the Dead Space Downfall movie before you play this game, seeing as how it's available to buy on Steam, and was heavily recommended back when Dead Space first came out as intended to be watched before you played. But to summarize it a bit, the Earth is running out of resources and population is growing, yada yada yada, the same shit you hear in every one of these futuristic stories with spaceships. It is what it is, but it serves its purpose. Planet cracking, aka mining random planets in the solar system for their resources, is our main way of keeping the Earth going. And again, the Ishimura is the best of the bunch. Just recently, it picked up something called a marker off of a planet by the name of Aegis 7, which has started to cause the mining colony there to go batshit insane and start killing each other, eventually leading to said planet getting overrun by some kind of monster known as Necromorphs. When the Ishimura pulled the marker into the ship, the same thing started to happen up there too. Now through the downfall movie and the prequel game, Dead Space Extraction, we learned that a Necromorph outbreak started on the Ishimura in two separate ways. Through the marker simply being aboard the ship as mentioned, and also through an infector sneaking aboard the ship in a shuttle that came from Iju-7. For now though, the USG Kellyan has no idea that any of this has happened, as all they've received was a distress beacon. Now again, I know we're getting a bit complicated here, that's just how Dead Space is, but I would like to mention that this particular beacon was sent by the star of Dead Space Downfall, Alyssa Vincent, the Ishimura's chief security officer, who for some reason not only looks different both times you see her in Dead Space lore, but also left them a whole fucking video message explaining what's going on around here. That they never bother opening, which means everything that is about to happen here could have been avoided if someone here had some common sense and simply click the goddamn play button. But anyway, our crew for the mission consists of Isaac Clark, our protagonist and the engineer, Kendra Daniels, our computer specialist, Zach Hammond, our commander and the head honcho, and two of his officers whose names I'm not even going to bother to mention because they'll both be brutally murdered within the next five minutes. Isaac has a personal stake in this mission as his girlfriend is one of the crew members of the Ishimura, working in the medical deck. She has sent him a transmission telling him how much she misses him and that the ship has gone to ship and she's all alone, which is the reason he jumped up and personally volunteered for this mission. They find the ship and try to make contact, but the entire thing is blacked out and gone dark. And when they attempt to auto dock, that system seems to be offline too. The gravity tethers malfunction, crashing the Kellyan into the Ishimura's docking bay. It's here we get our first hints that Kendra and Hammond simply do not get along. They all exit the ship and have a look around. Once we're free to move about and get a feel for the controls, we learn a few things about how Dead Space functions when it comes to HUDs. Now, disclaimer here, I fucking despise what the word immersion has done to the average video game journalist and an average YouTube critic. Every time I hear a dude say a game shouldn't have done something because it ruins my immersion, I can't help but roll my fucking eyes. You've got a damn piece of plastic in your hand. You push a button and the game does a thing, all right? Cut the bullshit. But Dead Space does do a good job at trying to immerse you. It is worth commending because it does so in a way that's not intrusive and restrictive just for the sake of being realistic but rather in a clever way. See, Isaac's health is linked to his rig, which is basically what the game calls as futuristic tech. The rig really is just supposed to be one specific piece, but the games have a habit of referring to the whole suit as the rig, but it's really just the metal bar along his spine. Blue means you're fine, yellow means caution, and red means you're about to get fucked up. 
His ammo count is handled the same way. It's placed on the weapon so you don't have to worry about going back into your inventory to check it or reload it like it's 1998 or having it take up the bottom of the screen like it does in other games. Not that there's anything ever wrong with that, but this is just a pretty cool design choice. Swapping weapons will tell you how many shots you have in each weapon period, while aiming will only tell you how much you have in the current mag. So really, you'll only ever have to open your inventory to check on your general supplies, and thankfully, you won't be doing any of that Tetris shit that Resident Evil 4 makes you do. Every item takes up one slot in your inventory, and every weapon has a max amount of ammo per stack it can fit. Simple and clean, like the Kingdom Hearts song. On his back is also his stasis meter, a tool that we'll touch more on a bit later. One other thing of note that really seems simple right now, but back then it was kind of like, goddamn, a horror game with some common sense, is being able to swap weapons using the D-pad. Now, just about every other third-person shooter game ever made since Gears of War came out had this figured out. Or, you know, it was like, press Y to swap to your secondary or something like that. But for the longest time, Resident Evil was still doing this goofy-ass pause the game to, you know, check your inventory thing. And as much as I love Resident Evil 4, the two biggest things about it that have aged poorly compared to other games that have come out after it is that it was still hanging on to this ancient archaic game design, as well as the whole you can't move and shoot thing at the same time. Both problems Dead Space does not have. As a matter of fact, around this time Dead Space was up against Resident Evil 5, as the two would be coming out barely a year apart if that. And while Resident Evil 5 is a great game, one of the biggest things it got mocked for was Chris Redfield still not being able to fucking move and shoot. Even though Isaac Clarke could. Capcom was still for some reason holding on to this rule to add tension. Even though most horror games, even the ones that were survival horror, had figured out that this was fucking dumb. Long before Capcom finally stopped forcing you to turn into a rotating statue if you wanted to open fire on anything. Silent Hill figured this out while the PS1 was still around. It's not all positive though. Isaac in this game in particular, out of the rest of the trilogy, is the most sluggish and clunky he will ever feel. He can't reload without aiming, and because Visceral Games, which yeah yeah I know was EA Redwood back when this game originally came out, so you can go ahead and put the nerdsplaining comment away, hadn't quite nailed the control scheme yet. And some of the buttons are in different places than they'll be in Dead Space 2 and 3. So you'll fuck around and accidentally use a med kit every now and then. If you've been playing the later games recently. Happens to me all the time. Anyway, back on the story path. Like I said, this is a CEC sanctioned repair mission. CEC standing for Coordinates Extraction Corporation. Once the crew gets inside the ship, Hammond has Isaac run a quick diagnostic so they can figure out what's wrong with the ship since there's no one around, and from there it all goes tits up. The two movie extras are killed, and Kendra and Hammond are separated from Isaac, who makes a break for the elevator, and is greeted with the moment I mentioned earlier. He searches around a bit and picks up a plasma cutter from a workbench, with the words cut off their limbs written in blood. If I remember right, there's a YouTube critic by the name of Chris Davis who didn't like that this game will constantly for the next 20 minutes or so hammer it into your head that the best way to kill these things is to dismember them. But honestly, it's not really that big of a deal. What this game was doing at the time with dismemberment and telling you that your headshots didn't mean jack shit really hadn't been done yet. So them taking a lot of time to let the player know that they're gonna have to throw what they know about fighting monsters in this type of game out the window is welcome to me even if it means the type of player who starts getting upset when he's quote unquote handheld. Oh, so fucking cringe. Just has to get over it. I know the Dark Souls crowd likes to think that the world should revolve around their specific taste and less obvious learn on your own tutorials. And I'll admit that putting an audio log on the floor that tells you you should cut off their limbs, then stepping about two feet forward and having your commander call you to tell you the exact same thing is a little overkill, but for the most part, these cut off their limbs, writings, and logs 
are from different people on the Ishimura figuring it out and then passing the message around to help out their friends and colleagues. Something I'd find pretty believable in this situation. After we pick up our first weapon, we can hear someone beating on the door asking us to help them. So we blast it open and he's zeroed, and we get our first taste of the game's combat. I'm playing on the hard difficulty here, so it's going to take a bit more work to get limbs off initially, but usually cutting off both arms is the way I like to go about dismembering necros. Like I said earlier, the game makes a big deal about the dismemberment, and it is important, especially on higher difficulties, but the concept has to have its limitations for gameplay reasons. So shooting the limbs off actually just does more damage and is what you should be doing, but it's not 100% needed to kill a necromorph. Otherwise, weapons like the contact beam or later the seeker rifle in Dead Space 2 would be absolutely worthless. It would be extremely unbalanced in ammo type for you to absolutely need to 100% dismember every single limb for every single enemy, especially as time goes on and enemies get tougher. Speaking of weapons, for right now, let me introduce the Dead Space franchise's crowning achievement and one of the best video game weapons of all time, the Plasma Cutter. This thing is beautiful. Absolutely can carry you from start to finish through the entire game without you ever needing to purchase another weapon, at least in the first two games. Dead Space 3 and its high speed, high defense crack necromorphs are a different story. Strong, ammo efficient, and reliable. It's like if a horror game started you with a handgun, but instead of a shitty Markov or something, the game started you with a Space Desert Eagle and tells you to let it rip. One thing I do wish they had kept in later games is Isaac aiming this thing one-handed. I like when characters in shooting games have their own aiming style that isn't standard. It adds a bit of personality, some attitude, a little seasoning if you will. Unfortunately, this appears to be gone in the remake. The primary enemy type we'll be dealing with in the Dead Space universe are slashers. It's like an aggressive runner type of zombie with blades typically either sticking out of their hands or shoulders that they use to do what the name suggests. Most variants grab onto you and attempt to gnaw your head off, but other variants use their blades to try to stab you if they grab you. Isaac enters the tram control room and finds Kendra and Hammond on the other side. They need the tram system operational again, so that they can figure out what the hell is going on here and get out of there pronto. One thing about this game, which was a good idea at the time when this was the only game in the series, but has now become a bad idea in the grand scheme of the series, is that Isaac does not talk in this game. He grunts, he screams in pain, but he doesn't speak a single line. Most of his thoughts and feelings are kept in a personal journal that is in the objective menu on his rig. And that's about all you'll really get as far as a feeling of who he is at the time of this game. A lot of people miss this, but I recommend on your next playthrough, whenever an objective gets an update, take a moment to read about Isaac's thoughts and feelings about what's going on. Because if you don't, in the first game, Isaac feels like a robot that's just getting ordered around to do whatever the other characters feel like telling him to go do. He never does anything for himself and just follows orders, like a loyal dog. Up until the last 10 minutes of the game where he finally decides to do something without being told to do it. I know this was done at the time to add... Immersion. And keep Isaac from getting in the way of what the other player might be feeling. But considering the later games and how they improve on Isaac's agency, this is one of the biggest things I'm glad to see is getting improved in the remake as Isaac will be fully voiced, with Gunnar Wright getting to redo his role in this game with actual voice lines. A clear indication that sometimes doing some shit just for the sake of pleasing that immersion chasing crowd is not always in the game's best interest. Now of course there's a portion of the Dead Space fans unhappy with this change because it ruins the feeling of the original. To which I say, tough shit buttercup. I mean if you want a complete copy of the original game with nothing changed, removed, reworked, or improved upon, with just some slightly better graphics, then simply go buy a copy of the original game and simply upscale it to 4K on PC or something. It's right here. You can still play it and pretend that nothing here could be improved or tweaked or made into a more smooth transition going from Dead Space 1 to 2. This remake, on the other hand, is their chance to bring ideas and mechanics like Full Flight Zero-G into the first game and even improve upon them. 
making playing through each entry in the trilogy as smooth and as seamless of a transition in controls, mechanics, and characters as it can be. Hammond here makes a deal with Isaac. If he can fix the tramp system, Hammond will go to the bridge and access the personnel files to find Nicole for him. So to fix it, he needs to remove the broken tram from the tracks and replace the broken data board in the control room. En route, we pick up a stasis module to get us past a malfunctioning door. Stasis slows enemies and objects down for a second to help get past them or line up shots to take them down. Very useful, especially on higher tier foes. It's recharged with stasis packs or at stasis recharge stations. The game's controls are extra sluggish on PC compared to its console ports, even with the frame rate doubled from 60 FPS, so this stasis stuff will really come in handy here. On a quick side note, when getting footage for games I want to talk about, I typically stop for a second so I can write some notes and log my thoughts while they're fresh on the brain. In Dead Space's case, this gives me a second to talk about how great the ambient sound design is. Here, have a listen. You can hear all types of crazy sounds while exploring. Like things being kicked over, whispers, shouts, machinery moving along, and etc. Dead Space, one of the three games, is the most horror focused, so a lot of work was put into the atmosphere. I don't cream myself over atmospheric horror, because like I said in my Callisto video, that shit falls apart on repeat playthroughs for me, so I'd rather the devs focus on combat and making a game that's fun to replay, rather than something I consider only an initial playthrough trick, but Dead Space's atmosphere is one of the strongest assets, and I'd be doing it a disservice if I didn't mention it. We get a cool moment in this hall just before the tram room where the lights go out for a second and then all the doors are locked. Once we fix the tram blockage, we come back to this room and get our first look at the Leaper, the second most common enemy type in the game. They're a bit like slashers, only they have their legs fused together to form a tail, with a sharp bone at the end, that they typically use to do exactly what you think they would do with it. If slashers were regular zombies in Resident Evil, these would be the zombie dogs. Our next course of action is to go get that data board out of the maintenance bay. Some of the necromorphs, usually the slasher types, will lay on the floor and pretend to be dead. You can tell when this happens because a death animation will play. Necros don't have a death animation when they actually die. The ones already laying on the ground when you walk in a room or turn can be a bit harder to detect, especially when they're laying under a pile of bodies, unless you're actively looking for their slasher blades. Ammo can also be a bit scarce in these early chapters on the hard difficulty, but this problem is alleviated by chapter three when you should have more than enough and start running into inventory space issues. To help with this, unlike Resident Evil 4, Isaac can melee whenever the fuck he wants through a basic swinging attack and his iconic Isaac Clark stomp that has become a signature meme of this series. We also get introduced to upgrade benches and power nodes here. Power nodes work how you expect a level up point to work in an RPG. You increase your weapon's damage, reload capacity, fire speed, the works. You can also upgrade your stasis, your rig's hit points, air capacity, something you'll probably only ever do in this game, and I only recommend upgrading maybe once or so. Kinesis range and all that good stuff too. This is something else that could use a little work in the remake. Dead Space's problem is that a lot of things you upgrade have a lot of fucking dead space in their upgrade paths. You'll have to invest three or more nodes into certain weapons and even your rig before you can really get any returns on your investments. Add to that the fact that you don't get all your weapons until about the halfway point and can only hold up to four at a time. If you end up swapping a weapon out for another one you want to try out or like more, you're shit out of luck because all your nodes are wasted in a weapon that's sitting in the safe. 
Dead Space 2 allowed you to respec your weapons and pull nodes out of them to place in new ones for a price. And while I'm sure fucking over the player from wanting to try out new weapons and strategies is a classic survival horror fan's wet dream, for anyone else who doesn't like having their balls crushed as a kink, it's just irritating and discourages you from trying any weapon you don't get in the first few chapters. Something the devs realize, which is why they fixed it in two. Bring that improvement to the remake. We grab the data board and head back to the tram control room and fix everything up. Hammond and Kendra hop on the tram and tell Isaac to get the Kelly and prepped for launch. They'll find out any info they can and then they're getting the hell out of there. What's weird here is Hammond and Kendra Skype each other like they're in different parts of the ship when they actually just boarded the tram together and are probably sitting right next to each other. On the way back, we see the body of the guy who was beating on the door earlier has gotten up and left. We get back to the Kellyan and try to run a damage report, but it blows up and almost burns us alive. This might be the only point in the game where I actually ever almost run out of ammo. With their only means of escape in flames, they'll need to look around the ship for other means. To do that, they need the captain's authorization codes. But it turns out he's dead and being stored in the morgue. Isaac's next goal is to head that way and get Captain Matthias's rig. On the way, we get a look at our first store. This is where you'll buy new weapons, new suits, as well as ammo and other items. Speaking of suits, this is again somewhere where the remake can improve. Dead Space 2 and 3 allow you to go back to any previous suit you've purchased and put it back on if you don't like the look of the one you just put on. Keeping all the inventory space upgrades and armor increases of the next level the suit gives. This is a feature I really feel the absence of in 1, because the suit designs get better and better and peak at around level 3 and 4, with the level 3 suit being the one that Isaac is seen wearing in most of the promo material, and the signature premiere suit of the game, and the 4th being, being really cool looking as well with spiky looking armor, and the 5th level just going downhill, looking like too much, making Isaac look fat with this really weird helmet. There's another bonus suit you get for beating the game, but it's designed completely different from the main game suits and is just the armor the USM Valor soldiers were wearing. Chapter 2 takes us to the medical deck, the area Nicole worked in. But so far, she's nowhere to be found outside of a log detailing that the place has gone to shit and she and her subordinates are not equipped to deal with this many injured. Which we can see by the fact that there are so many bodies piling up, medical team had to basically just start cutting their losses and dumping them outside the front entrance because they ran out of space. We step outside the tram and see a blind woman who's clearly having a psychotic break over her dead and dismembered boyfriend. She hands us a kinesis module, then dies. Kinesis isn't really that strong in this game. Apparently it can be used to take dismembered necro blades and shoot them to deal damage, but it's not really worth the time or effort it will be in later games. It can be used to lift objects out of the way, grab projectiles out of the air, or to throw a box or crate at an enemy to knock them down, but don't be expecting to rely on it as an ammo conservation tool like you do in 2. On the way to the medical deck, we pick up our first weapon schematic, this one being for the flamethrower, which is a good transition into talking about the rest of the weapons. We've already discussed the plasma cutter, old reliable, but in addition to that we have the pulse rifle. Basically a space assault rifle. Standard military issue, good for spraying down necros and having them back the fuck up and keeping them stunned. Without upgrades, it doesn't do much damage, but it makes up for that with a large magazine size. That can be upgraded to about 175. Add to that that the inventory space is very generous. Basically holding an entire mag in one slot, and you can store a shit ton of ammo for this gun. As a general rule of thumb, I like to keep one row filled with plasma cutter ammo and another row filled with pulse rifle ammo in my inventory at all times as my go-to default. The secondary fire is a 360 spin mode for when you're surrounded. Next we have the Ripper. I don't use the thing really much, but it's a good weapon. It's a space chainsaw that works by suspending the saw blade in front of you and lets it rip. The secondary fire mode just shoots the saw blade out like a normal projectile. It's a very ammo efficient weapon being able to basically cut down a few slashers with a single blade if upgraded. 
but I personally don't like using it because there's a bug in the game's code that makes most of your ammo pickups be ripper blades if you have it in your inventory. Hogging all the ammo RNG for itself. Next is the force gun. The get the fuck off me special. It's basically a space shotgun, only instead of pellets, it shoots kinetic energy. As you can imagine, the closer you are, the more damage it does. Its effectiveness is a bit inconsistent even then, though. Sometimes it could take three or four shots to put something down, but most of the time, it'll decimate something from full health in one to two. As a kid, I used to sleep on this gun and never used it, but now it's a must-have staple in my inventory. Secondary fire in this game shoots a force grenade. The line gun is up next. Think of it as the big sister to the plasma cutter. Bigger and wider, cause she got out of high school and nobody told her to watch her calorie intake. With upgrades it can dismember either both arms or both legs off of something in a single hit. The secondary fire is a mine that does a shit ton of damage. Great for stasising something and then watching it blow it apart. Drawbacks to this gun are that it fires slowly without speed enhancements, and it's also a bit buggy. Sometimes if you try to fire it again, it'll stall and nothing will happen, which for some reason happens in Dead Space 2 as well. That and it's an inventory space hog as well, but with much less ammo in the stack. You only get about six shots in one spot, but it's another gun the game loves throwing ammo for you at which can eat up inventory space pretty quick for not a lot of shots in return. There's the contact beam, which is basically this game's magnum. It does a bunch of damage, but it's slow to charge up and without upgrades doesn't always kill everything in one hit. I'm sure, again, I'm probably just sleeping on it, but it's not really worth that wind up time in a game that has enemies constantly mauling and rushing you. It's secondary fire slams it into the ground and does an AOE blast attack that knocks everything back. Lastly, there's the flamethrower we mentioned before. A misunderstood gun. People say it sucks, but it's not that bad. Okay, never mind, it actually is that bad. Please don't fucking use this thing. You'll get yourself killed. The secondary fire shoots the whole flame takeout if I remember right, but I'm not gonna pull this fucking space trash out the safe to check. This thing was used in promotional screenshots, which means the team used this thing and was comfortable with how ass it is. Similar again to Resident Evil, while exploring the Ishimura, Isaac can pick up logs and notes detailing additional info and personal thoughts of the people who've died or played some part in what's going on in the ship. But where Dead Space sets itself apart is in the fact that you'll also get audio and video logs. All of this displayed in real time through Isaac's HUD instead of pausing the game like it usually does in Resident Evil. You can spin the camera around and flip everything to the wrong side and just dick about. The most interesting logs you'll run into are usually from Jacob Temple or Elizabeth Cross. These two are usually just one step ahead of Isaac wherever he's going, often having just left before he gets to a location unable to fix the problem that he'll proceed to try to fix. Jacob also has a parallel in his journey with Isaac, spending most of his time attempting to look for Elizabeth, who's a parallel to Nicole. Actually entering the Med Bay reception area, Hammond radios Isaac to tell him him and Kendra got separated. He has no clue where she's gotten off to. The crew has barricaded the entrance to the med bay itself to try to keep something out or in. Something explained away in Dead Space Extraction as a drag tentacle that was harassing the crew in that game, but we need to get in there so we need to assemble a bomb to blow it up. If we don't, there's no other way to get through the morgue that we can think of. Which is funny because in Extraction, characters in that game would use the vents to get around areas that were locked off. Instead of going through all the trouble to do something like this, but given the fact that the monsters get around through the vents, I guess not wanting to do that is understandable. We'll spend most of the first half of this chapter doing that and just exploring and getting backstory through logs. For example, conversations between a Dr. Kine and Captain Matthias, the person we're looking for, 
speak about something called a marker and how the colony on the planet they found it on is losing their goddamn minds down there. This is another thing the game could do a bit more of a better job explaining. But the Ishimura, when the Kellyan finds it, isn't just floating randomly in space. It's still hovering above Aegis 7, the planet they found the marker on because things started going to shit almost immediately after they got the marker off the ship. I know you can kind of see it when the game first begins, but likely when you first boot this game up, your eyes are probably drawn to the ship itself and not all the stuff that's surrounding it. The movie and comics, again, explain the actual outbreak a bit better. The marker was kept on Aegis 7 after the miners found it for about a week. But to my knowledge, it was still messing with them down below even after it was pulled up to the Ishimura. The damage had already been done. We also find out that most of the crew in a position of power, including the captain himself, are what's called unitologists. A unitologist is a religious nut job who believes the markers are divine and made by some sort of god to transcend humanity and death and blah 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 blah. The usual. They're of course off their rockers. And over the course of the series will be one of the biggest threats to Isaac. The three most important ones to know about are Matthias, Dr. Kine, whose faith in the religion is starting to deteriorate due to all the things going wrong, and Dr. Mercer, who's seriously so far gone you'd think he would have grown up to be a serial killer anyway if he'd never found unitology as an excuse. We're talking collecting heads, body parts, human tests, dissection, everything. On the way to build the bomb, we encounter three new things. The first is the power node door. These will require one node to open and contain ammo, supplies, and even schematics within, and are almost always worth opening. The other is our first zero oxygen room. Sound is muffled in these areas and it's easy to get hit by something that crept up in the silence. You'll also have the shortest default air supply in this game to an almost annoying degree. So first time players might want to put at least one or two nodes into the air supply, but no more than that as they're a waste. Once you get to know the game a bit better on fresh playthroughs, air will likely be the last thing you ever put a single upgrade node into. You can also pick up air canisters to help you out if you're running low on air in these sections, which is a good idea in theory, but in execution just doesn't work out. Air canisters take up precious inventory space that could be used for anything else, and carrying one around while having no idea when the next zero air area is on your first playthrough just handicaps your potential to store more ammo and health. You can just rush to a refill station in the rooms instead. The refill stations have no choice but to be in these zero air rooms because if they weren't, players who didn't have one couldn't progress, which would be stupid. So the air canisters are basically redundant. They seem to realize this because by Dead Space 2, the air canisters are gone and replaced by oxygen tanks throughout the environment and your air is just simply upgraded. The other is zero G areas. And these, Isaac's boots are locked to the ground and to move around, he can zero G jump onto most walls. It can be a little disorienting, but it works well enough for what it's trying to do. This is one of the things I mentioned that the remake is improving on to bring more in line and consistent with the rest of the trilogy. Where Isaac will be freely able to move around and land on walls whenever he wants instead of just jumping around like he does in this game. I forgot to mention one of the new enemy types in this chapter, the Lurker. These are usually infected babies from either living areas aboard the ship or the maternity wing. Not too completely sure on the lore here, but it looks like some children can be conceived through some sort of glass growing jar thing here. They usually crawl around and attach themselves to walls to throw projectiles at you. If they're positioned horizontally on the ground or on the ceiling, they're basically just begging to be line gunned. Anyway, we assemble the bomb and Isaac just stands in front of it while it blows up like he's lost his motherfucking mind. Seriously, Isaac, what the hell was that? But with the doors open, we can make our way towards the morgue. On the way, passing by the room from Nicole's last transmission to Isaac and picking up some more logs from her, even though she's nowhere to be found. We get to the morgue and encounter what I consider to be the game's first real boss fight. 
An infector shows up and turns Matthias' corpse into an enhanced necromorph. In this case, the enhanced slasher. Starting with the infector, these guys do what they sound like they do. In this game in particular, they'll tend to usually only ever make enhanced slashers and twitchers. Something I'll talk a bit more about later. The easiest way to deal with these guys once you know they're going to be around is to stomp all the limbs off almost all dead bodies you come across. They can't infect any bodies that don't have limbs since the game would have to kill that enemy as soon as it's made. The go-to strat tends to be to stomp the heads off, but I've had times where I've stomped a head off and still had an enhanced necromorph made, so to keep it safe I usually just stomp all the limbs off. Enhanced slashers, on the other hand, will be a real problem for much of the early game. They can knock off about three bars of health in one slash and are extremely tough and dangerous right now, while we have little to no weapon upgrades. Eventually, we do bring him down, and from here on out, enhanced slashers will show up every now and again to be assholes. Hammond calls us up on our way back to the shuttle to let us know that he's found some more info on the monsters on the ship. This isn't your standard viral outbreak. This is an alien parasite taking over the crew. He also tells us the engines are offline, which is messing with our anti-gravitational pull measures. Couple that with the fact that the ship is hauling a shit ton of minerals weighing us down, and you can see the issue. Isaac needs to head to the engine room and get everything running again. Chapter 3 is where we fix the engine situation. This is also what I consider to be Dead Space's prime vertical slice level. If you wanted to have somebody try Dead Space and figure out what it's all about and see if it's for them, this is the level I would use. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be fixed here to bring the engines back online. Chapter 3 is also when the Temple and Elizabeth logs actually start to show up. It's also the location of our first tentacle grab. These are moments when Isaac walks through a door and gets snatched by a tentacle that you need to shoot off before it drags you away to your death. Your threat of dying here is actually pretty low unless your aim is just god awful. I assume they wanted you to still be able to pass through this section with just one ammo clip so they don't make it too tough. Once we refuel the engines and get the anti-grav running, it's time to head to the engine room and boot everything up. On the way, Kendra re-establishes contact and we run into what's called the corruption. Basically a collection of biomass that spreads and consumes everything over time. Even people, which we can see in the form of premature guardians. And is said to smell fucking horrendous. It also grows way quicker than it can be cut down. Making trying to remove it completely pointless. In the engine room, we deal with our first pregnant slasher. Do not shoot them in the gut if you can help it. Their belly is full of swarm. Bone-like insects that will bite at Isaac's suit and can do a lot of damage in numbers. This particular room was used as an old demo back on the Xbox 360. It's also one of the most famous rooms in the franchise. Something that's paid homage to in the Callisto Protocol. On the way back, Isaac gets a message from Nicole and Hammond orders Isaac over to his location on the bridge. The ship is about to pass through an asteroid field, and what do you know, the asteroid defense system just so happens to be offline, which means Hammond and Isaac needs to fix it. Listen, I know the ship was completely dark when the Kelly and crew found it, and they need to find some way to make these chapters for the game, but as much as I love Dead Space, Isaac having to be ordered to fix everything is kind of a flaw that stems from their decision to make him silent here. He has no drive whatsoever. The main reason he's here is for Nicole, and she will be a main plot in both this game and the next game, but here there's not a single chapter ever dedicated to really ever looking for her, because every single chapter in the game is about Isaac moving, fixing, or hauling around some kind of machine or equipment, and most of the chapters in the game are just about something that's broken. I'm a gameplay guy more than a story guy, but come on, man. Chapter 4 takes us to the bridge. Kendra and Hammond get into an argument over the marker, with Kendra believing Hammond is holding out information. Hammond says he honestly has no fucking clue what the marker is and honestly is just there for a repair mission. Isaac makes his way to Hammond but almost gets grabbed by a big ass monster on the way there. Something that will become a big problem in about 5 or so minutes. Also on his way, they run out of time and the ship enters the asteroid field. Asteroids have started to hit the ship pretty hard with hole breaches basically everywhere. 
Isaac needs to get the guns back online quickly. On the way down, we grab the schematic for the best suit in the game, and I run back to the store immediately to put that shit on. Before coming back and having a discussion with Hammond about how to get the guns operational again. Hammond will stay on the bridge and try to get everything up and running, but Isaac has to reroute power from three junction boxes. Before he can do any of that, he needs to head back to bridge security to get the elevator working first. On the way out the door, we see Hammond eject an escape pod with a necromorph trapped aboard. And we head to the bridge security room where we run into the game's second boss fight, so to speak, the Brute. These things are Texas tough. They're made from several bodies and bones that have hardened and become one being. They're like angry armored gorillas. Their weak points is their joints in between their arms and legs and their backs. Everything else is mostly armored. If they have both of their arms, they'll try to attack the player by ramming into them or punching them. If they've lost a limb, they kind of give up and start flinging explosive projectiles. Optimal strat is to freeze it with stasis and try to place a line gun mine behind it. After Isaac heads to the security office and gets the elevator power back up, you'll notice that Isaac is starting to have visions of Nicole through TV screens, something that will become a recurring theme throughout the game. Along the way, we pick up a video log that shows Dr. Kine killing Matthias by jamming a sedation needle into his eye after relieving him of duty, which is how he ended up in the morgue. In the prequel movie, it's shown to be clearly an accident, but here it's more ambiguous as to whether or not it was accidental or on purpose. Another new thing starting in this chapter is malfunctioning gravity areas. Because the ship is damaged, some of the areas meant to keep gravity in check are busting badly with deadly results. You can use this to help you in combat against necromorphs, but stepping on them yourself is instant death. Other than that, we mostly just run around getting the boxes rerouted. Unfortunately, once we get them on, the ship passes through heavy debris, and one of the anti-asteroid cannons is acting up. Isaac needs to get over there and manually pilot the gun himself long enough for Hammond to fix whatever's wrong with it. That means running outside the ship through the debris field to get to said room. This section is the only real time your air supply will become a problem. You need to use parts of the ship as cover to make it across and get the timing down. With air refill stations sprinkled along the way. Once you make it across, you'll have to pilot the gun in a turret section. This is really the only part of the game that's just never been good to me. As a young teen, this part of the game gave me trouble. And even as an adult, I really don't too much like it. I think it's a bit unnecessary. It isn't what anyone really bought this game to do. And if you have trouble with it, it's just a giant ass roadblock stopping you from progressing. They could have lightened the amount of shit the game is flinging at you here. And it's even worse on PC where if you have the game jury rigged to run at 60 FPS, because this was made back in the days where console ports to PC were locked to 30, the debris is coming at you twice as fast since the frame rate is also tied to the game's physics, making it damn near impossible unless you either fling your sensitivity up on your controller or go back and change the frame rate back down to 30 FPS. So if you've ever wondered why this section is so obnoxious and keeps fucking you, that would be it. And of course, before that one guy that always comments, well golly gee, I never had any issues, this section is easy for me, get started because there's always one in a comment section. Nobody is interested in your pro gamer skills. Shut the fuck up. Anyway, once we're done, Kendra calls us to let us know that the ship air is now being contaminated by something. In hydroponics, and if we don't kill it, we're gonna all gonna suffocate soon. Wonderful! So now we need to head back to the medical bay to make a poison. Hammond volunteers to head to hydroponics before anyone else and try to slow down whatever it is. Long enough for us to see about making a poison. Chapter 5 here is about when the gloves come off and the game stops fucking around. You should have almost all the weapons, you know all the mechanics, and now it's prime time. We need to head to the chemistry lab and grab the stuff we need for the toxin. A lot of the chests that were locked before will be open now. A lot of the dead bodies that were spread everywhere and those body bags have now just flat out disappeared, as if they just got up and walked away. Fully adult guardians get introduced in this chapter. They're stuck to walls and guard things, for lack of a better description. 
They have a long, sharp tentacle that comes out of their chest and will insta-kill Isaac if he gets too close. They also shoot weird baby pod things that act like stationary lurkers. To beat them, you need to shoot all their tentacles off. Optimal secret discord tech involves freezing it with stasis when it shoots all its tentacles out of its chest and shooting a line gun mine before it can retract them all back in. Freezing and then shooting a line gun mine seems to be the best tactic in a lot of cases, as you can see. In the chem lab, we pick up the chem capsule we need, and Dr. Mercer shows up in the flesh. He will be the thorn in our side for a good chunk of this game from this point on. Doing things like babbling on about God's plan and yada 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 over the comm, rerouting door locks, locking us in locations, stuff like that. Here he yaps on him for a bit before unleashing his greatest creation, the Hunter. This will be the first of the series signature regenerating enemy types. The Hunter in particular was made by Mercer injecting corruption directly into a test subject's skull. You can't kill this thing because it will of course regenerate, so you need to slow it down and run from it. At a couple points, Mercer will lock you in a room with it and several other necromorphs and you'll need to hang tight while Kendra unlocks a door. The chem capsule is worthless without a necromorph DNA sample, which we'll have to go to Mercer's lab to get. Now that I think about it, why couldn't they just use a sample from any of the dead necromorphs we've been killing and save the trip? If it has to be a corruption sample specifically, the guardian we just killed is surely a good specimen. It's obviously for gameplay reasons, so we'll let it slide. When we get into Mercer's lab, we see he's off his rocker. There are severed heads everywhere, and logs suggest that Kain is having hallucinations of his dead wife. Later, we'll also find that Kendra is having hallucinations of her dead brother, which hints at the marker making people see things that aren't really there and foreshadows some later events. Mercer, in retaliation for us opening his office, straight up shuts off life support and all air in the medical deck. And Isaac has to race past the hunter to get it back on. Once he does, it's back to the chem lab to mix the compounds and create the poison. Mercer, impressed by Isaac's determination, locks the way he came in and directs him to the cryo room, where he shows Isaac his plans to freeze as many necromorphs as he can and send them back, back to Earth to start another outbreak there. We also get our first mention of the hive mind. After that, the hunter shows back up and we deal with him in this room. This fight is a bit bullshit in my opinion. See, even as a high school kid, I spent a lot of time reading wiki pages on different things. And before I even had Dead Space, I would read wiki entries on the different monsters in the plot and etc. This is a habit that would often spoil games for me because I would have to wait for my mom to buy them since I didn't have a job myself. So going into this, I knew what to do. But I couldn't imagine trying to figure out what the fuck to do here without any guides or help. This whole battle here is a gimmick. If you know what to do, it can be over in about 10 seconds on average. But it's not immediately obvious you should freeze him until you've likely spent a shit ton of ammo. The real problem is that the game doesn't really give you enough time to observe your surroundings in this room. All the hints are here as to what you really need to do. But Mercer starts babbling through the glass as soon as you walk in. Which means your attention is likely drawn to him. And the millisecond he's done talking... The hunter shows up as well as a bunch of lurkers. So there's not really a lot of time for you to look around and be like, huh, maybe I should try to freeze this thing. The easiest way to fix this would be to have Mercer be absent until you try to open the door to the room that he's in. Showing back up when you walk back into view of him. So that the player has a little time to take in the room, observe it, and get a feel for what they should probably do here. Either way, with that over with, Kendra opens the door to another tram and we head to hydroponics with our completed poison. Chapter 6 is where we take care of the air pollution problem. This area of the ship seems to be where the food is grown. We run into Hammond, who isn't looking so good since he's down here in the thick of it without a helmet. He says he got a good look at something fucking huge in the food storage area, and that's what Isaac needs to kill. Unfortunately, some of the crew has also transformed into necromorphs that are poisoning the air. I forget what these are called. I think it's potters. But either way, Isaac can't open the food storage area until he deals with them to bring air quality back up to acceptable levels since the door won't open. Most of this chapter will really just be searching for them, with zero G or zero air sections thrown in here and there. 
I think this is one of the other levels that was demoed or shown to the public prior to the game's release, if I remember right. The only other things worthy of note that really happened is another drag tentacle encounter and the introduction of a new enemy type, the Exploder. Again, they do what the name suggests. Most of their body mass is shifted into one of their arms and become extremely volatile. You can shoot it to blow it up, or shoot the limb off and use it as a kinesis grenade, or a makeshift exploding barrel. If you let them get too close, they'll slam their arm into the ground and do their thing. Once we get done with the potters, we can open food storage and deploy the poison. Of course, it only weakens it, and we need to get in there and finish it off ourselves. This is the game's first official proper boss fight. The Leviathan, I think it's called. It's got a few different modes of attack. The main one being slamming its tentacles around like a madman while you move around trying not to get hit. Another involving a tentacle sweep. The best way to dodge this is to zero G's jump to the opposite side of the room before it gets to you. But the hitbox on this attack can be a little fucked up and hit you anyway, which is a problem because Dead Space has a series has this problem where if you were in the middle of an animation like a zero G jump or a dodge roll or something when something hits you, or say for example you got knocked down and a necromorph takes another swipe at you while you're down on the ground and you're getting back up, you will still take all that damage. There's no invincibility frames. But there's no hit reaction either since it can't interrupt the animation you're already in. So you're just kind of stuck like that until the animation's over, taking whatever damage is thrown at you. This is specifically a problem in this boss fight because of the camera and the fucked up hitbox. Isaac's rig is not always facing the camera when you zero G jump. So oftentimes you won't even know you got hit before you could get away until you look at your health bar and it's missing a chunk when you land. Outside of that, you're supposed to shoot off the yellow spots on the tentacles. Here I need to get off on a bit of a sidetrack because there's a great channel for Dead Space lore when it comes to weapons, monsters, and history, and just about everything by the name of the British Runner. And usually he gets his stuff spot on when I watch his lore videos. But in one particular video that I can't quite remember the title of, he says something about the yellow spots on these necromorphs being a gameplay feature and not canon to their anatomy. And there's no other way to put this, but that's just blatantly fucking wrong. In Dead Space 3, during one of the boss fights, one of the characters will ask Isaac how they're supposed to even hurt the monster that they're dealing with. And Isaac specifically says, shoot the yellow spots. Later, in that same fight, the character will say something along the lines of, Are you shooting the yellow spots? This is a real in-game canon conversation. The yellow spots on these creatures are, in fact, canon. Like I said, usually his stuff is legit, and I highly recommend him. But that remark really bothered me because it's just blatantly incorrect. And he's played all of these games multiple times, so he should know he, that was wrong when he said it. That being said, just don't ask the man for his horror game takes on anything that isn't Dead Space. Callisto Protocol being worse than Dead Space 3? You're out of your fucking mind, dude. Anyway, when you cut off enough tentacles and start doing enough damage, it'll start throwing explosive pods at you similar to the ones that the brutes can throw. You should dodge out of the way of most of them. And then you have three options. Dodge the last pod and slam the yellow spot with gunfire. Kinesis the last pod and throw it back. Or dodge the last pod again and instead grab one of the explosive barrels floating around and fire one back at it. Either way, eventually it dies and Hammond disappears again. The crew locates an SOS beacon aboard the ship in the mining deck and our next course of action is to try to find it and launch it out in a last ditch effort to try to get some help. Chapter 7 is in the mining deck. If you're reading Isaac's logs, he'll mention that he knew a lot of the men in this section in particular. The plan here is to take the SOS beacon and attach it to one of the asteroids in the bay waiting to be smelted. The control room Isaac needs to access to launch the asteroid is, of course, fucking locked, so he needs to get a key out of the processing deck of the ship. On the elevator down, we catch a brief glimpse of the hunter free from cryo and stalking Isaac again, but he won't show up to attack Isaac for the next few chapters. Another thing I should mention is that I intended to play through all these games on the hard difficulty, but there's a bug exclusive to the PC version of this game that changes your difficulty level one level down should you click the continue button in the main menu when you're trying to resume your game.
You can fix this by downloading a cheat engine and configuring a bunch of bullshit that I'm not about to do because I shouldn't have to. So keep that in mind. Always resume your game from the load game option instead of the continue option if you care about the difficulty you're playing on. Isaac finally meets up with Nicole face to face in this chapter. She just kind of appears out of nowhere from around a corner. In hindsight, it should be pretty obvious that Isaac has lost his damn mind. Again, she just shows up from behind a fence. She knows exactly what we're trying to do and how to help us unlock a door to get to the SOS beacon. I'm assuming if you've made it this far in the video, you've heeded the spoiler warning and either know the twist here or have guessed it while playing, but Nicole is not really here. She's long dead by this point in the game. Isaac refuses to watch her farewell tape to the end out of denial that it might have been her saying goodbye. He's completely hallucinating here. This is another part of the game that is weakened by Isaac's inability to talk. This is supposed to be an important moment for his character. A sigh of relief for him, since he can put the worry that Nicole has been hurt away. Later in the game, we'll find out that Kendra knows Nicole is dead, but also knows that Isaac has been seeing and hearing visions of her too. The problem with that is that Isaac doesn't talk in this game, so how does Kendra know that he's been seeing her? They kind of overlook that. So we're left to fill in the blanks ourselves and just assume that Isaac does talk throughout the game. We just don't hear him. Isaac tells Kendra when she contacts him again that he's seen Nicole, which of course confuses Kendra because she knows that she's dead but just hasn't told Isaac yet. But see, that in itself opens a whole new can of worms as I'm writing this because why in the hell didn't the crew check for info on Nicole back in chapter one? Hammond and Kendra were able to easily check for info on the captain, right? Not all the info, but they were able to check whether or not Matthias was dead and where his location was at. You're telling me Isaac didn't bother to ask them to look her up while they're at it? They didn't take any initiative to do so themselves. Let's roll with the excuse that maybe they didn't have info to the whole crew until after they had Matthias's rig code. Kendra tells Isaac right at the start of the game that they'll look for her once they're on board. Now they didn't know what they were walking into at first, so I can understand them not really focusing on it at the time. But Isaac, for sure after seeing what's going on, has to be worried sick about her. And Hammond, right at the start of chapter two, says, get me the captain's rig and I'll help you find Nicole. And then he just doesn't? At one point in that same chapter, Isaac even picks up a video log from her. Then Hammond radios him again, trying to figure out when that log was made, but can't. Isaac then walks right into the room Nicole died in, goes to the morgue, gets the captain's rig, walks right through the room she died in again, and then Hammond calls him back up and just doesn't do that. I'm serious, he just straight up doesn't. Acts like he never said anything about it. Not a mention, not a whisper, nada. I will excuse that instance because Hammond is obviously focused on what's going on with the engines. But while Isaac is fixing them, there's complete dead air. He has plenty of time to look something up real quick. It took Kendra what, all of about 10 seconds to look up the captain? Speaking of Kendra, she's no fucking better. Because she just shows up from somewhere else where she's able to recontact them and give them additional information on things wrong with the ship. Locations of key items and the like. She literally says she can access everything from where she is but makes zero attempts to ever help Isaac find Nicole, and Isaac doesn't even ask her because, again, he can't talk. Keep in mind, she contacts them again in Chapter 3, and Kendra will be in this room until Chapter 11. So it's safe to infer around this time that she maybe looked up Nicole, saw she was dead, and just doesn't say anything to Isaac to keep his head clear. But again, Isaac can't talk, so he never asks her to look. What this does is make Isaac look like a complete bumbling idiot with no backbone, constantly being taken advantage of in this game. This is why I typically don't like silent protagonists. The stories around them just usually awkwardly revolve around stuff you're supposed to overlook and tiptoe around. That kind of cost just isn't worth the immersion of them being silent to me. And I can count on one hand the amount of times it hasn't gotten in the way of a game story. This is something they need to flesh out a bit more in the remake now that Isaac has a voice. If it were up to me, once Kendra contacts them in Chapter 3 and says she has access to all the ship's records and logs, 
I would have him ask her to locate Nicole and have Kendra lie and say that she can see her rig and that her status is alive, but her exact location is being blocked. Also having her tone change or have her stutter a bit when she rushes to this explanation. Just a tiny little wink and nudge to the fact that she might be lying to those paying attention. It's simple stuff like that that can go a long way. Returning to the task at hand though, Isaac needs to protect Nicole while she opens the door. She then makes up an excuse as to why she needs to leave. She has no way across and then disappears. Isaac grabs the beacon, heads deeper into the mining deck now that Kendra has lifted the lockdown, and on the way there we pick up the level 4 suit. Like I said, this design isn't too bad, I like the leg spikes, but this is the last good looking suit. We head towards the asteroid, release the gravity tethers, running into enhanced leapers for the first time, and then plant the beacon. Head to the control room and launch the asteroid. Of course, now something else is wrong. The receiver isn't responding, so Isaac needs to head back to the bridge, which is where Chapter 8 takes us back to. A ship, the USM Valor, has shown up with the group assuming it's due to the distress signal they launched. The problem is, with the receiver down, the Kellyan crew can't communicate with the Valor. The Valor can talk to them, but they can't talk back. Isaac needs to get to the comm station and repair it. Along the way, we fight the divider for the first time. This enemy has two forms. One is humanoid, where it will attempt to swipe at Isaac or strangle him with his tongue. Dismembering it will result in the limbs breaking off and jumping at Isaac. Now these limbs have shown up separately at various points in the game, but only now do we see their full form. If the player damages the first form of the divider enough, it will break apart and they'll all attempt to swarm and attack him. The most dangerous piece being the head, which will attempt to dislodge Isaac's and take over his body, attempting to form another divider. After fixing up the comm array, the Valor sends a message that they've picked up an escape pod. The same one that Hammond shot out of the bridge back in Chapter 4. This is a huge problem. We again attempt to communicate, but something has latched onto the ship and is also blocking communications. God damn it! Isaac rushes to the nearest anti-air cannon to shoot it off. This is our second and final cannon section and the very last time we'll need to quit the game to change it to 30 FPS and then back to 60 FPS when we're done. This is basically the same thing as last time, only we also need to shoot the tentacles off. Once it's dead, we try to warn the Valor, but it's too late. That slasher they picked up has started a complete massacre aboard the ship. The crew was completely caught off guard and didn't stand a chance. Worse than that, the pilots have been killed, so the Valor is completely unmanned and crashes smack into them Ishimura, knocking Isaac out. When he wakes up, Hammond calls him and tells him that he's been trying to reach the crew, but someone has been blocking his rig signal. Very suspicious. There are three possible explanations for this. One being that Kendra is right, and Hammond has known all along about the market and was on a secret mission from the CEC, but just isn't telling his crew similar to what the Prophet was doing in the Crisis series. Second is that it's Mercer blocking Hammond's signal to sabotage the crew's efforts. But third and more likely here is that it's Kendra blocking his signal in an attempt to leave him stranded without help to die and take control of the mission herself. Speaking of said mission, Hammond finally admits defeat and calls it off. He's found a shuttle in the crew deck of the ship the Singularity Corps is fucked, but if they can salvage one from the Valor, they can abandon ship and get the hell out of here. The back end of the Valor has jammed into the Ishimura during the crash, so that's the way in. He agrees to meet Isaac there, and they set off. This is actually probably the shortest chapter in the game. Chapter 9 is a standout chapter in my opinion. I'd put this as my favorite chapter of the game, even if I'd honestly say that Chapter 3 with the engines is probably the chapter that best represents the definitive Dead Space experience. When we start it, Hammond calls up. One weird thing I've noticed is that while watching the footage back, when he calls Isaac, he says, Isaac, you made it inside. Isaac hasn't made it into the valley yet, so I think this call was supposed to go right after Isaac entered the valley, but the devs wanted to put a glimpse of the next enemy type there instead, so they moved it here and just overlooked that. Hammond takes a look at the munitions logs, and looking around, this ship doesn't seem to have just wandered by and picked up their distress signal. They're not doing recon, they're not randomly patrolling, and they're stocked to go to battle. 
meaning they likely knew what was going on. Knowing what we know about Dead Space 2 and 3, I'm going to assume that this is an undercover EarthGov operation to board the ship, exterminate all threats, and steal the marker for themselves. This is kind of confirmed by a log you can find in the Valor, mentioning what's called a deep cleanse. They were unfortunately caught off guard by the slasher in the escape pod. You'll have to suspend your disbelief a bit here, and accept that one ship full of fully trained combat soldiers, prepped for war, wouldn't be able to handle one slasher before it creamed everyone aboard the ship, who all know what they're walking into, know of the marker's effects, and all that. But let's softball this a bit and assume that the slasher didn't kill everyone by itself, just the navigation crew, because the escape pod was intercepted by that room, and that with no pilot, the ship crashed into the Ishimura and more necromorphs boarded the ship afterwards, and began to spread by the usual means after that. I was going to skip ahead and not mention this, but one of the Valor's guns busted open and left radioactive waste that Isaac has to throw out into space before he can get into the Valor. With that being the case, I have no fucking clue how Hammond got in seeing as how he not only has no helmet and is exposed to radiation, but the gun surely busted when the ship crashed and would have locked him out the same way Isaac is locked out. As I mentioned, when we first enter the Valor, we get a glimpse of a new enemy type and my personal favorite of the entire franchise, the Twitcher. They also have some of the best death animations in the series, in my opinion. These guys are like slashers, only made from the bodies of security officers and soldiers equipped with stasis units. Their stasis units built into their rigs somehow fuse into the organic matter, and even more strangely is having the reverse effect of stasis, making their body speed up and twitch. In this game, they dodge side to side in patterns, making slower weapons like the line gun and the contact beam hard to use against them. They close in extremely quickly, and as you can imagine, will just slash away and pummel you. They are an extreme threat in any encounter and should be prioritized. The singularity core Isaac needs is in the back of the ship in the engine room. On the way there, Isaac gets a message from Kine, begging him to help him return the marker back to the planet, and hopefully end the outbreak instead of just using the shuttle to run. There's also a cool mini game in the shooting gallery that Isaac can score various prizes herein from power nodes to semiconductors. A clear homage to Resident Evil 4. When Isaac gets the parts he needs from the ship, it begins to go critical. Hammond shows up and is killed by an enhanced brute serving as our next mini boss. I'm always sad to see Hammond go out like this. He seems like a good man that honestly just got played by the higher ups who knew the dangers of this mission but sent him in blind with no intel. Even if he did know more than what he was telling everyone, he still tried to look out for his crew and tries to sacrifice himself to save Isaac. I say he tries, because he gets absolutely destroyed and Isaac still ends up having to kill it after he dies anyway. So really, he did what he did for absolutely no reason. Kendra also immediately knows that Hammond has died, as she can see his vitals flatline from her position. Gotta ask again, why hasn't Isaac asked her about Nicole since he knows she can do this? For now, let's just explain it away as some part of Isaac knowing that she's dead but not wanting to hear the truth from anyone looking her up, so that I don't pull my fucking hair out due to this lack of common sense. With the Singularity core in hand, Isaac escapes the Valor while is having a literal meltdown and makes his way to find the shuttle Hammond was talking about. Chapter 10 is sort of the beginning of the end. We're here to look for the shuttle and repair it. Turns out it's not just the Singularity core that the shuttle is missing. All the navigation cards are gone too. We'll need to find all three to get this damn thing moving, in addition to the crew key needed to access certain parts of this bay. There's dead bodies all over the damn place with their heads wrapped up in holes stabbed through their foreheads. And markers and unitologist mumbo jumbo scratched across the walls, and we're soon about to find out why. Before that though, we head to the locker room to pick up a nav card. I think this is the last chapter where we have to do this kind of shit, so kiss this chapter filler stuff goodbye. You can only walk into so many areas and so many chapters where you need to find a new access card before your brain starts to break. Honestly, think about the fact that they had Captain Matthias' rig codes back in chapter 2. So they should have access to just about everything. He's the commander of the ship, the one in charge. So he should have authorization to go basically anywhere he wants. But everywhere we go, we not only have something to fix, but need a key card or 
something to lift a lock down on top of that. Also in the locker room is Zero G Basketball, which is a nice little mini game, but not really my style like the shooting game was. And we also pick up the level 5 suit schematic, which is the ugliest suit in the game, and now we're stuck with it. Honestly, as a teenager, I used to just do level 3 suit runs and just stick to the three rows of inventory space that came with it. Because I just didn't like being stuck in this level 5 suit. Mercer has found Temple and Cross, and has already killed the later. We can't do anything to help him before Mercer stabs him in the forehead too. I feel bad for the guy. He spent this entire game just ahead of us, trying to get him and her out of here into safety. And he's kind of forced to watch her die before him. Though honestly, I find it hard to believe Mercer was able to overpower them like this. See, we learn later that a lot of Unitologists on the Ishimura walked out on the faith and the religion as soon as they saw what the hell was going on aboard the ship. But for all of these people to get overpowered, tied up, and killed by Mercer alone so he can make more bodies for infectors? Look at the guy. I'm willing to explain away all the bodies in the lobby as the ones who stayed and agreed to the mass ascendance, let's say. Unitologists are shown to do this even in the comic. But I just don't see him overpowering both Jacob and Elizabeth long enough to execute them both all by himself. He walks off before we can get to him, and we check the room for one of the crew keys. Heading out, Kain contacts us again and says that he can explain everything going on, and he needs to talk to us face to face. Once we have the nav cards, he'll unlock the shuttle area. We run into our final drag tentacles section, and then about midway through our search for the keys, the hunter shows back up. Avoiding him, and with all the keys, Kynes opens up the executive area, and Kendra warns us that Kine might be off his rocker too. Which is cool and all, but honestly no one could be as bad as Mercer. Here Kine explains what's really going on. Basically what I've already explained earlier, and in addition to that... Kine was the one who sabotaged most of what's wrong with the ship in an attempt to keep it from taking off with a marker, since he didn't want this chaos to spread back to Earth. His dead wife, Amelia, has been telling him what to do throughout hallucinations. When they brought out the marker from Aegis 7, a creature called the Hive Mind was set free, and Kine thinks it controls the Necromorphs. He wants to return the marker to seal it and maybe stop this. Knowing what we know about the markers in Dead Space 2 and 3 and in this franchise as a whole, this plan is completely off the mark. The hive mind just being a creature in a position of dominant power when it comes to the necromorph or alien food chain, able to give directions to his subordinates. But unless I'm missing something, it doesn't make sense for the marker to want to be returned to Aegis 7. It's not like it's the home world. This marker is man-made. And even before they establish the rest of the lore, Aegis 7 is just some planet the Marker was dumped on. I mean, I guess you could argue the Marker wants to be back on the planet because it's much more likely to be able to make a brother moon or something. Something we'll touch on in Dead Space 3. There, rather than it is stuck in some cramped ship. But even then, the Marker has a much better chance of making a moon out of the Earth with more people on it than a mostly vacant planet like Aegis 7. So you would think it would want to be taken there like the moons do in 3. The plan to stop the hive mind even turns out to be worthless and not even work anyway. Since it still just ends up being the final boss and Isaac has to kill it the old fashioned way. So this is all a bit confusing. It's probably best not to think on it too hard. Hopefully the remake makes this make a bit more sense. In the grand scheme of the whole franchise. Kind tells us the marker has been in the shuttle bay this whole time. And Isaac agrees to his plan. Then we proceed to enter the second most fucked up room in this game. The actual captain's cabin. There's like a million fucking pregnants in here, dude. I'm in here dodging around, trying to get shots off without breaking any bellies, and I'm in here just getting treated like Piper Perry. Eventually, I give up and just take the risk. Speaking of the captain's cabin, you can see all previous captains with portraits up on the wall. In this room, we also get some confirmation through Matthias's journal on the fact that yes, he is a Unitologist, and he handpicked Unitologists as most of the authority figures on the ship. In addition to basically jacking off to this marker, Unitologists also, like most religions, have their own prophet in the form of a man named Michael Altman, who they believe is a martyr to their beliefs, and started the whole religion way back when. 
Problem is, and this is something that the average player will likely never know unless they're invested enough in the franchise, is that Michael Altman was set up. If I remember right, what exactly happened is that he was a journalist who found out about the markers and the groups experimenting with them that I believe was EarthGov, or what predated EarthGov, and he was trying to whistleblow and expose them for what they were doing and tell people about how dangerous all this stuff was. Instead, they had him and his girlfriend killed and doctored up a whole religion to help them spread markers through the people and conduct more research, twisting around his words and using him to do the exact thing he was trying to avoid. Moving on, Isaac reaches the shuttle bay, fixes it up, and starts to test fire it to make sure everything is up to snuff before Kind gets there. Here we'll deal with the hunter for a final time. Like the previous fight, I guess you're just supposed to run around and waste all your ammo before you can figure it out. This one is a little more obvious since you probably know there's some gimmick to it based off the last fight, but I still don't think these kinds of fights work in horror games, mostly because it's way too easy to waste a shit ton of ammo and fuck yourself over while you try to figure out how to beat this. Most games today would probably zoom in on whatever can help you to give you a hint, but Dead Space can't really do that since its identity is always being behind Isaac's back with no cutscenes until the very end of the game. With that taken care of, Kine takes the shuttle back to the cargo area from the start of the game, and we head back to the tram. Mercer calls us up and spouts some religious cuck mumbo jumbo one last time before he lets an infector ascend him. We put him out of his misery and then head off. Chapter 11 sees us right back where we started. Kine's waiting for us to bring up the marker so we need to get to it. Remember how the captain's cabin is the second most fucked up room in the game? Well, this is number one. The amount of threats in this room is insane. I'm getting pummeled. The gang is all here to stop you. Even tentacles are back. Who the hell even knows what these ones are attached to? After getting the marker to the shuttle and loading it up, we go to join Dr. Kine, but Kendra blasts him like Order 66 just got declared, and tells us she's been playing everyone the whole time. She's an undercover agent for EarthGov, hired to bring in the marker. She's also likely the one who tipped off the Valor to where the Ishimura was. This marker we've been hauling around isn't the original, it's the main made copy that was created for study and then dumped on Aegis 7. They activated it on the planner a couple of hundred years ago. And then when it got too dangerous, hid the whole planet and the system around it off the grid. Now that it's been uncovered again, EarthGov wants it for resources. She also confirms the marker can seal the hive mind away for some reason. Like I said, they haven't quite thought out this whole marker thing in the grand scheme of the series yet. So this isn't really consistent with the sequels. Kendra leaves Isaac for dead and escapes with the shuttle before Nicole mysteriously appears and begs Isaac to help her get it back. She tells him to use the gravity tethers to pull the shuttle and the marker back to the Ishimura. Kendra panics and ejects from the shuttle using an escape pod down to Easter 7. By this point, everything about Nicole is clearly suspicious. Why would she even care about the marker? Why would she beg him to bring it back? Why would she know about the plan to take it back to the planet? It's pretty clear something isn't right, and even when you get into the room she's in, all the electronics flicker and freak out. But they board the shuttle together and head back to Aegis 7. Chapter 12 is the final chapter, but also starts pretty funny. See, every other chapter starts with a pan out from a screen. Even chapter 1 starts with a pan out shot from Nicole's message. Now, the dev team clearly couldn't figure out what to do for this chapter, since there is no tram, so that shit just abruptly starts with you standing around. The planet is an absolute ghost town, completely empty, everyone's dead. We can find a law from the protagonist of the Dead Space prequel motion comic, Newman here, but he's nowhere to be found either. We need to drag this marker through the colony to its resting point. Nicole disappears after we power up a door so we're on our own. We drag it around, restoring power here and there, and eventually drag it to the pedestal it's supposed to go on where it lets out a signal that offs every necromorph on the planet and we head towards the shuttle to get out of here. 
Kendra shows up with other plans, though. Says she's taking the marker back and lets Isaac know that he's gone batshit, too. As we already know, Nicole's been long dead. This is the first time we ever get any emotions out of Isaac as a character and not just an avatar. He breaks down and Kendra makes off with the marker. There's also no a random ass asteroid that is about to collide with this planet and blow it up for some reason. And if Kendra takes that shuttle, Isaac will be trapped when it does. With no other plan, Isaac makes a break for it back to the shuttle before Kendra can get to it and we gear up for the finale. As I'm writing this, I'm actually trying to figure out how the fuck Kendra got back to the shuttle before we did, let alone with the marker. We drag this heavy bitch all the way through the loading bay to bring it around. Then we open a few doors and Kendra's already here? Just as we come out the door, she gets absolutely creamed by a tentacle and not in the way I was hoping to find on Rule 34. It traps Isaac and turns out to belong to the hive mind, who is not happy about her trying to move the marker again. This boss is pretty simple. It's basically just the Leviathan again, only with more slamming and less tentacle pod shooting. I think you know the drill by now. Dodge side to side, avoid the slam, shoot the yellow spots when it's done. About halfway through the fight, it will grab you up and try to eat you. Which can be tricky because the game inverts your control since you're upside down. Though I believe you can go into the pause menu and just invert the aiming back to normal until it drops you, and then switch them back to make this part easier. Other than that, it can really only shoot out some pods and make necromorphs to distract you. But they'll likely be killed by the thing flailing its arms about trying to kill you. Once we bring it down, Isaac runs to the shuttle and takes off as fast as he can, barely missing the collision. Drifting out in space, he takes off his mask, relaxes for a second, reflects on the fact that he made it out, but he's still feeling down about Nicole's death. When he looks over, she jumps out at him before the screen cuts out and the credits roll. In the prequel movie, set in between Dead Space 1 and 2, we find out this is just a hallucination, and Isaac is stuck aboard the ship screaming to himself and going insane until EarthGov finds him. I love Dead Space 1. It's a great game. Every game in this trilogy has its own individual strength, and for Dead Space 1, that strength is its atmosphere. You can definitely consider this the darkest and most horror of the games in the trilogy, which I can see some people thinking automatically makes it the best of the three. But from a story perspective, it's definitely the weakest of the three. And I'd put it in second place as far as gameplay goes, but that is arguable with Dead Space 3. Even with Dead Space 3's faults in the gameplay department. Simply because it is less jank to play. And in my opinion, Dead Space 1 is kind of overshadowed by everything Dead Space 2 will do better than it does. Even if it's less scary. And who knows? Dead Space 1 Remake might be able to nudge out Dead Space 2 in the gameplay department. Though that is going to be extremely difficult to do, because Dead Space 2 as an overall package, in my opinion, just kind of trumps all over this game. From gameplay, combat, design, story, the works. Speaking of Dead Space 2, like I said earlier, I recommend both watching Dead Space Aftermath and either playing Dead Space Mobile if you have an Android, or watching a playthrough of it on YouTube. I have one up if you're curious, but it was a couple years ago. EA removing this game from sale forever should be criminal. This game was fantastic. I played it all the time. It was literally one of the closest things to a console game on a mobile phone that you could find. One of the best mobile games ever made, without a doubt. Stay true to the over-the-shoulder concept. All the core principles from Dead Space 1 were there, and best of all, it was its own story about the unitologist tricking someone into starting the outbreak on the sprawl. That's not the only issue when it comes to Dead Space 2's release, though. See, Dead Space Extraction, the on-rails prequel shooter to Dead Space 1, came bundled with a lot of copies of Dead Space 2 on PlayStation 3 back in the day. I remember because I had one. Why would they bundle it with that, you might add? Because of the motion control gimmicky bullshit. Lord, you remember 6-axis? You remember the PlayStation Move? Ugh. But also because of the planned Severed DLC that would conclude the story of characters from Extraction. Unfortunately, Xbox never got a port of Extraction, and Sony's backwards compatibility is fucking awful. 
So no matter what version of Dead Space 2 you get, you're getting fucked. The PS3 version used to be the best deal back in the day, the most complete. Together you got Dead Space Extraction, Dead Space 2, and the Dead Space 2 Severed DLC. Completely concluding the story of those characters. This unfortunately has become the worst version of the game due to Sony's incompetence. The PC version offers the best visuals and comes with a sweet deal of almost all the DLC suits and weapons. But there was a catch to that. This was to compensate for the fact that the PC version did not get the Severed DLC. Because PC ports around this game did a lot of shady shit, and developers used to really not care about them and consider them an afterthought. That makes the Xbox version of this game, FPS boosted to 60, and up the most complete package you can buy today. If you're interested less in all the DLC suits and weapons, and more in the traditional story DLC. The Xbox version gets a few graphical upgrades thanks to Xbox's backwards compatibility, but even with that, it's not as pretty as the maxed out PC experience in terms of visuals due to the anti-aliasing. But it gets close enough and you can always buy the extra suits for this version should you choose. The downside being since Extraction never released on Xbox, you're less inclined to purchase the Severed DLC, and if you do, but have no prior knowledge of who Gabe and Lexine are, they're just this random fucking couple in the DLC, instead of it being about two characters you actually care about. When it comes to the core game though, there have been some changes here. The most important being that Isaac now has a voice. Dana, I'm locked out. There's something in the church. It, it broke the door. Hang on. I'll try to override all the gates in the area. Hey, there's something out here, too. He is a character now. He takes initiative, he has drive, has conviction, and it is his idea to fix up things that are broken now, instead of being ordered all the time. He is the one coming up with the ideas and solving problems, and the game is better for it. Combat is also now improved in just about every way. Isaac controls better, everything is more responsive, weapons are improved in usefulness. Unlike Dead Space 1, I don't think there's a single bad gun in this game. It also comes with the expected stuff, like improved graphics. Honestly, when I think of a definitive look for early 2010s graphics, this is what it looked like. Man, just look at that. Nostalgia. The good old days. Our story picks up about three years after Dead Space 1. EarthGov, like I said, found Isaac floating in space, babbling like an idiot, crumpled in a corner somewhere in his ship, and has put him in what appears to be a loony bin hospital. In that time, he's been subjected to experiments, torture, and interrogation. We open up the game immediately into one of these sessions, where we get a look at Nicole's new design and actor, who's gone from a college girl to a MILF in her 30s to 40s. I remember being confused as hell the first time I was introduced to her new look and voice. This is also the game's way of bringing players that maybe didn't play the first game up to speed on what's going on. And also our first outward way of knowing how Isaac feels about what happened now that he can talk. He's not just sad because she's his girlfriend, like was the case in the first game. There's a genuine connection these two have. It was Isaac's idea for her to take the job on the Ishimura. It's the most famous ship in the planet cracking business, and he didn't want her to regret not going. When things went wrong, he dropped literally everything Ethan Winter style to come try to help save her, and he failed. We get a good look at just how guilty he feels when an apparition of her climbs on top of the table and starts screeching at him before he passes out. And I'm probably not supposed to be turned on by this, but I am. <laughs> When he comes to, we meet Franco, the protagonist of another spin-off game, Dead Space Ignition, that also takes place just before Dead Space 2. Funny enough, this is one of the ones that is backwards compatible on Xbox, but isn't really worth playing. I think it's some kind of interactive novel game or something, which is very niche, so chances are it's probably a waste of your time. He's here to try to rescue Isaac and bring him back to Dana, his contact, but that doesn't go according to plan. Okay. 
Don't feel too bad about him getting his shit rocked here, though. If I remember right, he basically leaves his girlfriend to die in the middle of this new outbreak as soon as his watch goes off. And his mission to go get Isaac activates, so he for sure had it coming. Speaking of outbreak, after Isaac headbutts Slasher Franco and takes off, we can see that yes, there is a new outbreak and it's not like before. Before, Isaac got there to the Ishimura minutes after damn near everyone on board had died. This, this is worse. This outbreak is still fresh. Still in its early stages. There's a lot of dead and freshly turned here, sure. But plenty of people here are still alive, running and trying to evacuate. The Ishimura is also just one ship. This is basically a whole city he's been transported to. On top of that, for right now, he's stuck in his straitjacket and defenseless. Security is ordered to shoot him on sight and purge the whole facility. He's confused as hell, and even runs into the same doctor who was interrogating him at the start of the game, who has lost his own marbles. Just before that, though, we pass through the offices just above where we were being held and can watch back footage of another patient, one named Nolan Strauss. If you haven't watched the Aftermath movie, what you should know about Strauss is that he had a wife and a child. A baby, actually. He was stepping out on them with one of his co-workers and accidentally released a necromorph outbreak aboard the ship he was stationed on when studying a marker shard. Him and a few others, including the woman he was cheating with, survived the outbreak, but his family didn't. Early in the outbreak, the shard made him go insane, and when he went back to try to get his family, he hallucinated them as necromorphs and killed them himself. His mind has broken, he's gone insane, and he's been ridden with guilt ever since. The co-worker he was cheating with was silenced and framed for that outbreak, and EarthGov killed all other survivors but Strauss as they had no connection to the marker and kept him for experimentation, like Isaac. In his interrogation section footage, there are references to a machine and his eye hurting. Something that will be very important later. Back to the doctor here, he cuts us free and gives us some med packs and a flashlight, and then offs himself. Here we can see that the button layouts have changed a bit, and it can fuck with you if you try to play these games back to back. Also, it can't just be me who thinks the rig sounds effects are noticeably low quality. This seems like a PC exclusive issue though. The sound effects sounded fine to me on Xbox One. Dana, the woman Franco was talking to before he got offed, calls Isaac up to tell him that he's suffering from dementia, which he got on Aegis 7, and that it will kill him soon if he doesn't get to her. Last time he trusted a woman who said she was there to help, she tried to leave him stranded on a ship filled with bloodthirsty aliens for a paycheck. So naturally, he's not really feeling too trusting here. She sends him a route to her. This plot will make up the first arc of the game, with Isaac constantly being redirected around due to various issues. A lot like the first game, Isaac writes in his journal about objectives and his thoughts on things that he really can't express all the time in conversations. His locator system has also been upgraded to flip between things like save points, stores, benches, and his objectives. Things like text and logs no longer autoplay in case you're attacked when you pick one up, but it's a simple button press to activate one. Here I guess we should briefly touch on Dead Space 2 being filled with more jump scares than the first game. Now I know the general opinion from hipsters has become that jump scares are cheap, and that somehow being afraid of absolutely the fuck nothing happening is for some reason considered to be a much more refined and well-crafted horror experience. But since I typically disagree with this opinion, being of the mindset that I might actually fucking want some enemies to show up in my horror game, or things to actually jump out and scare me, I don't consider that to be the reason that Dead Space 2 is less scary overall. Dead Space 2 being less scary being something that I do actually agree with. Even on my first playthrough, Dead Space 2 never really felt scary. But I think this is more so to do with the horror genre's inherent issue of I've already beat these guys that comes with the sequels. I played the shit out of Dead Space 1 before Dead Space 2. I recognize who they are, what they are, how to beat them, what their strengths and weaknesses are, you get the idea. But you don't really have to have done that to recognize that this is a bit of an inherent flaw in most horror franchises as a whole. I said the same sort of thing in the Callisto video, but 
How many times can Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees be scary? How many times can zombies be scary? Again, I consider this to be a sort of nostalgia for old school survival horror. Where new horror games get criticized when their sequels aren't scary. But Resident Evil 2 and 3 seem to get some sort of pass when it comes to not really scaring anybody. Just because they're Resident Evil 2 or 3. When in reality, I don't really consider them to be scary. But to have a better gameplay loop overall with what monsters they do use. Regardless of whether or not they're scary. I really just wanted to get my stance on this whole jump scare versus atmosphere thing out of the way quickly. But I do prefer Dead Space 2's approach to horror where shit's actually going on. Now if you think jump scares are cheap, that is your business. But recognize that ain't jack shit but your preference. Because I can't recall a single room in Resident Evil that was ever memorable for its atmosphere. But I can damn sure remember the time Nemesis busted through the fucking wall in the RPD. I rest my case. Vents are a new feature used to get around as a way to help load in more maps and assets, I imagine. Dead Space 2 is a much larger and more ambitious game than its predecessor. So the vents do their job well. And this was made during that time where games started to be a lot larger overall. And Dead Space 2, if I remember right, was one of the first games to really sort of do this. There's occasionally something crawling in one, scurrying away, but visceral games aren't morons, and they know you can't fight back, so they don't push it. Isaac is still a bit of a chunky dude, so he'll often fall his fat ass through a vent like he does here. He finds someone who's floating around on a kinesis bed, and we're introduced to two new things. The first being Isaac's much more hands-on approach to engineering. He actually does things now. Program stuff, hot wires things, does more than just pushes some buttons on some holograms. And secondly, the new and improved Kinesis itself, which has been upgraded to be able to take sharp objects like rods, brooms, blades from slashers, and impale them, often pinning them to walls if enough damage was dealt. Which is a great tactic to save ammo, and one we for sure need right now because we still need a shooty bang bang thing. On the plus side, we get introduced to how loot works now and the upgraded melee. Isaac punches and stomps much faster now with no momentum lost. Even better than that, any damage dealt to an enemy after death has them drop some form of loot. Credits, health packs, ammo, you name it. Bigger, tougher enemies like brutes will often either drop power nodes or semiconductors. Isaac comes across a dude who happened to have some of the worst fucking luck you could have during a mass outbreak and is strapped to a table mid-surgery. He sees his opportunity to make himself a plasma cutter and takes it, but is too slow to save the guy. This new plasma cutter is a bit of a jury rig, but you can get the old standard issue one from Dead Space 1 if the game detects a save file for it. Oddly enough, the old plasma cutter is the one used in most of the game's promotional art and material. So I'm assuming the custom one Isaac makes here was a decision that was made late into development. P.S. Because filthy peasants had trouble aiming with the lasers in Resident Evil and Dead Space 1, the game defaults to a centered crosshair that kind of fakes being the laser sights from the last game. Some of you have probably never even noticed it, just like I forgot for a few of the early hours here. Which is why you'll see me with it in some of the beginning game footage. But if you actually love yourself, you can change it back in the options menu to the aiming choice of the chads. You'll also get a bunch of reminders to dismember enemy limbs to do extra damage and kill them faster, just like last time. Running along through the hospital, Isaac runs into Strauss in the flesh. And they try to escape, but Isaac's fat ass is too slow to make it through the door before the security lockdown closes it. If you're wondering why Strauss seems to know Isaac, but he doesn't know Strauss, it's because patients were given drugs that make them forget previous days of torture for better results. A bit counterproductive to the whole we need them to remember to help our research thing, but these are the same guys who sent one ship to recover one of the most dangerous artifacts ever made, and were shocked when everyone got massacred. It's also important to keep in mind where these patients are held is in a lower part of the hospital that regular staff is not allowed to access, to stop the truth from getting out. Isaac, upset because he's too fucking fat to run, blows up on Dana like it's her fault, and immediately regrets that decision and apologizes when he realizes he's for sure not getting anywhere without her help. She explains that Isaac is on Titan Station, aka The Sprawl, 
a city in space for civilization away from the dangers of Earth's energy crisis. Tideman is the head lawman around here and is trying to kill him. The marker Isaac destroyed back in Dead Space 1 was, of course, a marker, not the marker. Tideman and EarthGov use people like Isaac and Strauss to help them build another one to help power the city and try to reap the benefits of the marker without the downside. Unfortunately, the Unitologists don't like the idea of the government tampering with their religious figures, so they trick Vandal into unleashing the Sprawl outbreak. It's easy to manipulate the average Unitologist or EarthGov soldier, because only the higher-ups know what the markers really do. Any mishaps or misfires are usually covered up and blamed on terrorist attacks like the O'Brannon and Ishimura incidents. Planet cracking is actually starting to become outdated because only so many planets can be mined, which is why EarthGov has been pushing for marker research and sit Kendra and the Valor to recover the one on Aegis 7. The Ishimura was actually about to be decommissioned soon, which is why Isaac pushed for Nicole to take the job just for a once-in-a-lifetime experience. We enter a room where Isaac rips out one of the stasis modules, and we're almost back up to speed as far as equipment goes. This is another complaint I believe Chris David had for nitpicky-ass trivial reasons, because the game forces you to use stasis here to slow this enemy down. It's not that fucking serious, dude. It's a tutorial. The game flashes a damn box up on the screen and says, hey, do this thing here. So you understand what stasis does a bit better if you're not familiar with the first game. And have no idea why that enemy just slowed down and turned blue. And also to give you a little practice trying to hit a moving target. That's why the game insta-kills you if you don't do what it says and attempt to just shoot it. It's also why there's a door that closes too fast for you directly afterwards to make sure that you understand both what it does to enemies and what it does to objects in the environment. If you don't want to do that and you want to be fucking hard-headed, that's not bad game design when it kills you for it. That's you not listening to clear instructions. This isn't a fucking Deus Ex game where you do what you want. It's not an immersive sim, it's an action horror game. Just do the fucking two second tutorial and stop trying to be hard headed and special. Stasis works about the same as it always has. Its duration is just shorter since it was kind of OP in the first game and it recharges over time now. In the next room, we get our first look at a new enemy type, the puker. Like I always say, it does what you think it does. Try not to let it get too close to you for obvious reasons. It can also shoot out a spitball to slow you down so it can close in distance. But if you're quick enough, you can grab that and shoot it back at them, which will usually insta-kill them. Harder to do when they're not the only thing in the room trying to kill you, though. Isaac gets into an elevator, and we start to see he's not as sane as he thinks. Nicole shows up and starts to mess with him. He's holding it together here better than Strauss, but his mind and his guilt on what happened with Nicole... These hallucinations and dialogues between the two of them will be the central focus of this game and absolutely the best moments the game can offer. Eventually, we run into our first hole breach door. These will kill Isaac if he gets dragged too close. If you're wondering how these can kill a man being sucked out into space, if he will have a spacesuit for like 95% of the game, especially when he will get dragged into space at random at least twice later in the game, the devs thought of that too. So typically what happens is the emergency airlock closes on him part way through being dragged out. Severing body parts or something. This room is funny in particular because it just randomly breaks as soon as he enters. If it's this easy for a window to break in a hospital and kill everyone instantly by dragging them out into space, maybe building things and putting glass windows everywhere isn't the best fucking idea, Tideman. I have to wonder who put this guy in charge because clearly he lacks forethought and is a moron. We get to a door with a hole breach on the other side that won't let us progress without a safety suit. Luckily, Isaac's CEC codes still work, so the nearby store provides him with one for free. This engineering suit looks to be a good remix of the suit designs from Dead Space 1. This is also where we can get a classic plasma cutter from Dead Space 1 if we have the save file. Unlike Dead Space 1, you can switch between the suits you've collected whenever you want and keep all the previous stat and armor upgrades. 
The only thing that's suit exclusive are the individual bonuses you get for wearing certain suits. This is good news, because outside of the advanced suit, nothing looks as good as the default engineering rig. The security suit looks alright, but this vintage suit just looks fucking awful. I mean, I know it's meant to be, but I really don't want to run around the fucking game with Isaac wearing a busted condom on his head. The security suit also has the most variants. You can tell they were really proud of this suit because of the amount of color reskins you get. This is also probably a good time to discuss the quote-unquote problem with Dead Space 2 on PC. Like I said earlier, you get almost all the DLC weapons and suits on the PC version to compensate for being fucked out of the single-player DLC. Now, to some people, of course, this ruins the game. Because they don't have any self-restraint or the common fucking sense to just put all the damn DLC weapons in the safe if it bothers them so much. And just ignore the DLC suits completely until they at least have the default suit it's based on in the game. But to me, this really is not that big a deal. I'm pretty sure the DLC suits in general only give you about as much armor as the second suit you get in the game. So you get a little early boost at best. But it's not absolutely fucking game breaking like some people would have you believe. You get some weapons for free a couple chapters early. Wow. Big fucking whoop. In horror games in this day and age, all this shit would just be a pre-order bonus. Who gives a fuck? If you don't want to use them, ignore them. Have some goddamn self-control. It's much better to have them for free as compensation than to get absolutely the fuck nothing on PC like the Port of Dead Space 1 got. Seriously, both PlayStation and Xbox got their own exclusive suits. And PC just got a basic, barely supported port just thrown right out the window that had issues. Which is funnily enough exactly what happened with Callisto Protocol's launch. And as bad as that port was, can you imagine if Callisto Protocol had launched cap to 30 FPS on PC like Dead Space 1 and 2 did? Good lord, man, it would have been a massacre. So yeah, I'm glad they did something nice for PC players for a change. Because this game was made back in those days where PC players were worthless to developers. With Isaac geared up, we run into our first mini-boss, the Tripod. The Tripod just jumps around and tries to land on you and can be a bit of a pain in the ass without any stasis. Shoot the legs off, and eventually it really can't do much besides crawl around and try to swipe at you with its tongue. Afterwards, Isaac asks Dana for more info, and she tells him he needs to head to the apartment areas and take a tram here since it's the quickest way to her, and we're off. The entire sprawl is being overrun. And in addition to wanting all marker subjects eliminated, Tideman wants all civilians evacuated as well. I'm going to assume and pray that he has civilians evacuated to a planet, and not just the government sector on the sprawl, because knowing what Isaac will proceed to do to that sector later in the game and the people located there, that would have extremely problematic implications. While Isaac is roaming about, expect Strauss to contact him every now and then, and then babble on about marker talk and his hallucinations. On the gameplay side, some new things to highlight are that Isaac's helmet now lights up rooms on its own dynamically, and that enemies seem a bit easier to dismember in this game even on the harder difficulties. Probably because there's more of them per encounter and they're more aggressive, for balance reasons they need to be a bit easier to kill. When we get to the trim, it's a mess and we need to fix it up. Around this time, Nicole starts fucking with Isaac again, and she will proceed to do so for the rest of the game. How Isaac deals with his guilt versus how Strauss does is supposed to be one of the main themes of the game, but to be honest, it's not really that comparable. Strauss killed his wife and child. Isaac just pushed Nicole to take a job that went bad. I'd say Strauss got the business end of the blade here. Now that we're at the tram here, let's talk about set pieces. For those of you who might not know, set pieces are those big ass scripted action moments. These are usually fan favorite moments and memorable ones, but the hipster take on these in recent years has started to become, oh set pieces are bad because they take player choice away, blah 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 blah. So if you're like me and you're wondering where all these cool Uncharted style action sequences have started to go, again you can thank your average YouTube critic and your average video game journalist for that. Now what's become engaging 
is walking into a room with nothing happening in it and being able to read the environmental storytelling on the underside of a fucking desk. And everything needs to be convoluted where you can approach walking into the same fucking room from six different entry points with seven different endings to the game depending on which dialogue option you picked with RPG mechanics that bloat the game to about double the runtime that it should be. And anything other than that is generic, outdated, linear, and whatever other fucking buzzword people use now. Dead Space 2, though? Dead Space 2 comes from that pure, unbloated era by developers. Before games started needing to cram a bunch of shit they didn't need in them. To try to please people the games weren't made to please. And this train sequence here is a prime example of that. Back when this game first came out, this sequence was so dope it was nominated for an award. Isaac starts this train, gets it up and running, but it all goes tits up and Necromorphs start breaking in and the train starts breaking in half. So he needs to jetpack himself from the half of the train that just broke and is losing traction to the half that's still moving. Unfortunately for him, that breaks apart too and he barely scrambles out of getting killed in the crash. This kind of stuff, again, is apparently problematic for your run-of-the-mill snobby YouTube critic. Because it's not just another room Isaac walks in with spooky noises and lighting. So it's quote-unquote strangely paced. I say fuck that. This moment is just as sick as it always was. And in my opinion, these types of moments greatly help Isaac as a character. A quick thinker and an improviser. And during these set-piece sequences like this, he'll ha just have a split-second idea of how to get out of a jam. And he's intelligent about it. I know I often go on a rant here about how much I hate what gaming reviews have become on both sides of the spectrum, but this kind of stuff is why I decided to switch up my content to be my own voice in this whole YouTube critic thing, because I so fundamentally disagree with what these guys often consider good and bad game design, that I just can't keep letting no other opinion exist on this platform. Stop trying to turn every damn game into The Witcher 3. Dead Space is a linear action game. That is not a flaw. It's made for the audience it's made for. Let the action part of the game do its fucking thing. Moving back on track, clearly the tram thing didn't work out, so Isaac needs a new route, which Dana sends him. He'll need to cut through the marketplace, which is also where we get introduced to a new enemy, the pack. These are children about elementary school age that have been turned. A few of them are no real issue. They go down in one hit or two. But a room full of them can swarm you and be a real problem. Especially if you're trying to deal with other threats like pukers or something. Isaac starts to become a bit uncomfortable when Dana's route starts taking him through a unitology conversion center. But she assures him it's only because it's the fastest way to her. There's an old maintenance area behind the center that Isaac can use to take a shortcut. Side note is that as a kid I didn't know what this was to appreciate the aesthetic, but Dead Space actually takes place in a cyberpunk world. Something that has become one of my favorite looks thanks to stuff like Blade Runner and Cyberpunk 2077. A game which has become absolutely fucking fantastic by the way. Yeah, it had a rough launch. And no, it's not the deepest RPG with 8 million different endings based on whether or not you responded to a questions in a slightly different tone. But as a more story-driven action RPG, it's turned into a very good game with all the patches especially after 1.5 and 1.6. Highly recommend. In fact, I'm thinking of doing a video on it. Us being able to see the city from outside where we're looking makes me really rich for a Dead Space game that was set outside the city itself. No, it doesn't need to be some open world game or anything like that. Please, Dead Space does not need that. But something designed like Resident Evil 3 Remake would really be tight to see in the Dead Space universe. Making it to the maintenance tunnel and going through the usual flow of turning shit off and on to pass through something, we get our first feel of the new Zero G. We are completely free to fly around, move around, turn about, turn our gravity boots on and off, stick to the ground, etc. This is a huge improvement over what Dead Space 1 offered. And I can't wait to see what they do with these sections in the remake. Dana's route just continues to get more and more uni craze the further down the rabbit hole we go. Even the apartment blocks he's routed through are full of uni bullshit. Some of which seem to have gone to Mercer Academy and just kind of wrapped a bag around their head. Let the outbreak take over and hope for the best. We enter the church eventually and Isaac can feel that shit ain't adding up. 
But Dana insists again they're only here because it's the safest location. To get away from Tideman and his gunships that have been harassing Isaac any chance they get up until now. Getting to the church, I think it's a good time to talk about the new weapons and what I think of them. The plasma cutter is the plasma cutter. Trusty, dependable, should always be in your inventory. Nothing's really changed outside of the new flame shot upgrade later down the tree. Other than that, the upgrade path right down to the node placement is identical to the first game. The pulse rifle has received a new grenade launcher secondary fire and is overall more effective. The flamethrower has stopped fucking sucking. The force gun got rid of the force ball for a charged force shot. Everything else that's returning from Dead Space 1 is basically the same. Or has a secondary fire so similar in function I can't even remember the differences like the flamethrower. But the weapons themselves have been made a bit smaller in size like the ripper. The new weapons include the javelin. It acts like the necro blades and other sharp objects you can shoot with kinesis. The alt fire will combust whatever javelin you just recently threw. The rivet gun was a pre-order exclusive weapon I'm assuming, because when I originally played this game on PS3 it was completely absent. It's basically the rivet gun but weaker. It can carry a shit ton of ammo, but its DPS is pitiful. And it's more focused on the combustion secondary fire than the impaling primary. Then there's the seeker rifle. That's basically a sniper rifle I guess. I mean, it can be useful for dealing with enemies that are coming up, and it is a higher tiered damage weapon, but its reticle is so small and it's a long range weapon in a game where enemies rush up to you and stab you in the throat. Not really the smartest choice. Then there's the detonator, which is so useless I forgot it even existed until I was watching back footage of this while I typed this script. It's meant to be a tripwire that triggers when an enemy gets close to you, but in the time it takes something to pop out for you to recognize that said thing has popped out and then pick a weapon to use, you would have to pick somewhere to shoot this thing that is close enough to them, but not close enough to kill you in the radius. And by that point, whatever popped out has already eaten your eyeballs when you could have just whipped out the force gun and blown whatever the hell it was back to 1982. This seems like another enemy specific weapon that isn't worth carrying around when versatile weapons will work just fine on it. In the church, we get to see unis in their prime habitat, as well as all their little religious altars and all that bullshit. Like I said before, Altman was set up. This is the exact opposite of what he wanted. And his appearance on all these statues here is all wrong as well. This was a young guy in his 20s, not some 50 year old boomer. But religions work best when the prophet is some old wise dude, so they altered his depiction years later, like in most religions. This church area tends to loop back on itself a lot when you clear an area out so that you can get back to the store and get more supplies. This wouldn't be too noteworthy on its own, but Dead Space doesn't do this often, so it's worth mentioning. The church is also worth noting as the first time Nicole physically attacks Isaac. Up until now, she's just been screeching at him and guilt tripping him. Something breaks the door to the main area of the church, and Isaac gets stranded in a room with our main enemy type of the hour, the stalker. These guys run around and hide, waiting to charge at Isaac and catch him off guard to headbutt him. They tend to poke their head out every now and then just before they do, making them prime candidates for the secret rifle, but not enough to make that worth carrying just for them. They're a mild threat by themselves, much more of an issue when other enemy types enter the picture alongside them. But that's very rare, and I can only think of one instance of it in-game. Usually they're encountered in groups, but by themselves as THE encounter, if you get what I mean. You can also usually tell when it's time for them to show up because you'll walk into a room with a shit ton of crates and boxes everywhere like you're playing Gears of War. Dana decides to reroute Isaac through the morgue, slash the crypt, whatever you want to call it, but you can tell she really does not want to. She almost lets it slip and blows her cover that she's one of the religious nut jobs when she starts to tell him not to disturb the bodies but gets cut off by Tideman jamming her communications before she can do it, like a dumbass. This crypt area of the game is one of my favorites from a visual standpoint, but is also pretty short. All these dead bodies are in cryo to keep them primed for Ascension Day, which has clearly come. Because of that, necromorphs will just burst out of random ones and try to catch you lacking. 
Now, how the fuck any of these bodies managed to get infected while sealed in a cryopod? Who knows? If I'm understanding how the marker works here, sometimes infectors are needed, other times it can just reanimate bodies with nothing but the marker signal. Convenient way to explain doing cool shit just to do it. Isaac fumbles some wires, maneuvers around some mechanics, and falls his fat ass through another vent. Before making his way around the door he was blocked out of. And we get an unfortunate look at what did it in the first place. A female tripod. Much larger than the male and twice as aggressive. What seems to be its child for the sharp blade that's its tongue. This encounter functions like the old faithful drag tentacle, only with the weak spot way trickier to hit. Once you hit it enough times though, she decides she doesn't want this problem and gets the hell out of there. After some cleanup duty, it's mostly smooth sailing straight to Dana's location. When Isaac greets her, he's grabbed and subdued, and Dana reveals herself to be a unitologist. We are now two for two on Isaac being betrayed by a woman in an apocalyptic situation. Because these hoes ain't shit. Their plan, of course, is to take Isaac and use him to build their own markers to spread this across the whole galaxy. Because they're delusional. But before they can bring Isaac to their ship to lock him up, the EarthGov ship that's been following him up until now shows up and opens fire on everyone in the room like in the Matrix. And Isaac barely escapes into a vent on the floor and we get what has to be my personal favorite moment in this game. I absolutely fucking love this encounter. This shit right here is the prime definition of a YouTube critic's worst nightmare. The spitting image of fuck it, do it because it's sick. Isaac goes through all of that, escapes death by mere inches, and falls directly into some basement, where this big ass creature called the Tormentor has just been chilling at. I've heard this moment again criticized by Chris Davis, if I remember right, for being random, but I think that's what makes it such a fan favorite. This outbreak is not waiting on Isaac. Isaac doesn't even get a moment to catch his breath before he looks up and is like This reminds me of those scenes in those old cheesy horror movies where somebody outruns a threat, closes the door, sighs in relief, and then looks up and gets grabbed by something else. It's classic shit, dude. He tries to get away but gets grabbed, so we need to free ourselves and make a break for the door. You can't fight this thing, so you need to run. Just when Isaac runs out of ground and gets cornered, the gunship finds him again and starts blasting away, sucking him and the Tormentor out into space. Isaac makes a split-second decision to kill two birds with one stone and blows up one of the gas canisters to the ship. In the chaos, he gets blown back into the sprawl through glass and like two million walls, and there's no way in hell you're convincing me he doesn't at least have mild internal bleeding. Man, games used to be so fucking fun. Isaac feels defeated. He trusted another thotty and she let him down. He has no idea what to do now. Strauss calls him again and tells him that he knows where the marker is. It's in the government sector. And together they can destroy it and stop this outbreak. Trying to get to this government sector will make up most of the rest of the game from this point on. So Isaac sets off. Looking for a way through, he runs into some dead EarthGov officers, and a transmission from Tideman declaring everybody fall back for Operation Endgame. He also runs into the next woman to wreck his life, one Miss Ellie Langford. In this game, she's an absolute wifey, but in 3, she's going to do some questionable things. Isaac wants to work together to get to the government sector, but Ellie brushes him off and tells him not to follow. He's hard-headed though, so that's exactly what we're going to do anyway. We revisit a few areas that have gone completely dark and been completely overrun by corruption since the last time we passed through, and we cut through the school this time. Crawlers are introduced here. They're infants that have been taken over. They explode when they get too close. But, as dark as it is, the optimal strat is to shoot off the head of one and then fire it back into a large crowd similar to how you would handle an exploder. Ellie calls up to tell him she's run into Strauss. Isaac convinces her to let him live and look after him. They link up at the transmission hub and learn they're both CEC. Tideman cuts off power to the whole area, the train, and all life support, meaning if they don't get it back on, any survivors will suffocate, and they're unable to escape 
since power has been cut to the transit hub. Isaac then explains the game plan, explains who he is, who Strauss is, and why Tai Men is trying to kill them, and asks for her help. The plan is to align the old solar arrays at the top of the sprawl, and use the sun's power to power this area back online. So we set off for that while Ellie gets some panels open or whatever the fuck she does to help Isaac later. Her role here is a bit confusing and even more so later to me. Isaac powers up some stuff, fixes some other stuff, and then we hop in the elevator and have this nice sequence where we need to hold out against a whole pack of tripods trying to grab us. How the hell did they all get on this moving elevator? Who gives a fuck? Video game, son. It's beautiful. Once we're done with that, we travel through the solar array mainframe and disable anti. It's semi-sentient AI security measures, so time men can stop being a pain in the ass. We also run into a new design for the enhanced slashers. Gotta say, I'm not really a fan. I like the old design in Dead Space 1 a lot better. Here, they look like goofy-ass trash monsters with mold growing out of them. This is especially weird because every other enhanced necromorph for the most part follows the same design principles from the first game, even the new enemies. It's like this model was a test for something else and they just swapped it out with a proper one in the last few stages of development. After bickering with Nicole for a bit, we head outside and realign the satellites. There's a new enemy out here that's 0G exclusive and really only serves to have something to shoot at while you're in these areas. Barely worth mentioning, barely worth acknowledging. Now as far as what happens next, I'm a bit confused. This part always loses me plot-wise. From what I understand happens here, Ellie opens the other end of the panel so the arrays can collect power. But it turns out there were thousands of necromorphs on the other end that they just caught the attention of, so they run back to the train to try to get there before they get cut off. Isaac is clearly not going to make it back in time the way he came, so like a G, he says screw it and ejects himself through an emergency sequence directly back to the transport hub and slams through the fucking ceiling like it's Batman 1989. Another memorable fan favorite moment. If you ask Dead Space 2 fans what their favorite set piece moment in this game in particular is, it's usually either this or the needle machine. I know set pieces keep the YouTube critic top dogs in cope and seethe mode because there wasn't like 8 options to get back to the transport hub, all taking into account what Isaac put specs into in some skill tree and he couldn't talk to an NPC to resolve the situation peacefully in the player's non-lethal soy milk run of the game, but to people back when this game first came out, this moment was absolutely crazy in the best way. This is why I'm so against this gaming journalist light take that games need to stop doing set pieces, stop doing QTEs, and stop taking control away from the player at the sacrifice of all these great moments games used to have. Anyway, Isaac can hear the clusterfuck going on outside, and when he gets out there, he meets Ellie and Strauss again. And the transport hub just straight up blows up before they can get in. They're out of options. The only choice is to retreat into the CEC sector that Ellie just escaped from earlier. This upsets Ellie because, of course, she just came from here earlier. So all of her dead friends are still lying around. Some of which she had to kill herself. This is something audio logs we can pick up will chronicle in this area. The main goal now is to meet up at the central hub in the CEC. Once Isaac gets there, it turns out the door is jammed, so to get to her, he's going to have to circle around in the processing plant. Seems fine at first because Ellie has turned everything off, but Tideman being a dickhead that he is, turns it all back on and locks Isaac inside. We have to carefully maneuver around blades and entrance so we don't get turned into an Isaac Clark shake. Tideman has also overruled Ellie's codes and declared her dead in the system, so she can't help anymore. When he gets clear and meets up with the gang again, they decide to take the industrial transport to the government sector. Isaac volunteers to bring it down and is starting to lose faith in Strauss here, who is clearly starting to lose it. Lose it. Watching a few other videos, either from again Chris Davis or what might have been Dardigan, I've heard criticism here that Isaac is being a bit of a hypocrite, and, I mean, yeah, they're right. Isaac, it's your idea to keep dragging this dead weight along in the first place. We also get some more arguments out of Nicole and Isaac. These are probably the most crucial because they explain why Isaac never watched the full recording she sent him in Dead Space 1. It's implied here that he started to watch it with a sinking feeling it was to let him know that something bad had happened and she wasn't going to live. 
As soon as he saw her pull the needle out, he stopped the video and wouldn't watch it to that point or any further. Knowing full well she was dead, but feeling guilty and like he could still get there and do something. So when you play the recording in the first game and it just cuts out any time you load it to a certain point, it's not that it's not the full transmission, it's Isaac himself refusing to watch anymore. Something Nicole calls him out on, which is probably my favorite argument between them. Isaac calls the transport down and everyone hops aboard and to his horror he sees that Ishimura has been brought back here. Like I mentioned, EarthGov recovered it and covered it up as a hit terrorist attack and they're attempting to remodel it. Just then they smack something blocking the tracks which turns out to be a nest of tripods wrapped around some explosive tanks. So Isaac takes care of that and sets the whole place to blow. They barely make it out the blast at radius before Tideman starts to get frustrating and cuts EarthGov straight off the tracks away from the sprawl. Isaac gets the idea to board the Ishimura and use his old gravity tethers to pull EarthGov back on the tracks long enough for the transport to get across. This decision has Isaac completely fucked up. The Ishimura was the worst thing to ever happen to him and here he is again. And he's in here by himself. Well, almost by himself. It's him and Nicole to beat him over the head even worse. To make the matter worse than worst, Isaac isn't even really alone outside of that. You can find logs hinting at the fact that necromorphs are aboard the ship that the cleanup crew missed. And in addition to that, when Isaac destroyed the marker and won, every necromorph around and aboard the ship turned into a sludge, which I assume in the logs is the corruption. And when happy-ass, bald-ass Tideman brought the ship back, everything was cool until he started testing markers, then the corruption decided to reanimate, reforming necromorphs due to being in the presence of a marker signal. And on top of that, there are fresh necromorphs from the sprawl climbing into the ship as we speak, dude, come on. Every now and then, Isaac will also hallucinate something that occurred on the Ishimura previously, like a tentacle grabbing him or that sort of thing. So Isaac has to bring the gravity centrifuge back online, just like old times. But in the middle of him doing his business, Strauss has started to snap and has started trying to attack Ellie. He's doing this because the machine him and Isaac were hooked up to would stab them in the eye. He thinks if he stabs Ellie, she'll be able to see what he's seen. Isaac's tram has to detour through the medical deck, which is where most of the necromorphs are pouring through, and also where Nicole died. Perfect. We need to make our way backwards through the path we took the last time we were here. We also get a re-recorded video of Nicole's last words to Isaac with Nicole's new actress. Isaac, it's me. I wish I could talk to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about everything. I wish I could just talk to someone. It's all from a part here. I, I just can't believe what's happening. It's strange. Such a little thing. From the end, it all comes down to just one little thing. I didn't want it to end like this. I really wanted to see you again. Just once. I love what they've done with this video here. This is really cool. I've probably mentioned this before, but the biggest tragedy in all this is that Nicole almost made it out. The crew from Extraction found a shuttle, picked up her transmission to Isaac, and tried to contact her before she could do what she did. 
but the transmission was only one way. Like the first game, Chapter 10 is around when the game starts seriously trying to kill you, and all the knobs are cranked up. Most enemies from this point on will usually be the mostly enhanced variants. We make it to the bridge and Isaac pulls the EarthGov back with Tideman screeching at him to stop. Isaac tells Ellie to hurry across and he'll use one of the unlaunched pods to catch up with him. If everything was going tits up already, this would be when the double D's fly up too. Strauss snaps off the hinges completely. Ellie managed to get him under control and calm him down last time, but he's too far gone now. And he stabs Ellie through the eye. Isaac's escape pod also crashes somewhere random in the mining area, so he needs to circle around to where the transport car stopped. Isaac moves around the mine searching for Strauss, and when he finds him, it turns out Ellie is still alive. And she and Strauss wrestle for a while. Then, at absolute fucking random, a tentacle comes out of nowhere and drags Isaac outside into space. If there's one thing I'll relent on when it comes to criticizing this game... It's that, yeah, this particular tentacle was unnecessary. It feels to me like they wanted to separate Isaac from Ellie and Strauss here to add to the mystery, but couldn't figure out a good way to do it, so they just had something grab him and chunk him out into space. Strauss gives up on Ellie, who's been beating his fucking ass, and goes on the hunt for Isaac, and when he finds him, Isaac is forced to kill him. There's no other option. This scene is a bit funny because, you see, I haven't mentioned this yet, But Isaac will often remove his helmet whenever he needs to talk. He's fully capable of talking through the helmet and will do so on occasion, but folding it down back into his suit is just a habit of his in this game, and in the next one as well. But he also tends to remove it at the most inconvenient moments, like whenever Nicole attacks him or when he's dealing with Strauss. Now I'll excuse the whole Nicole thing because we know she's not really there, so it's really him trying to kill himself. But taking it off here for Strauss is stupid, because if you look closely, Strauss tries and fails to stab him, and it just bounces off of his helmet. So Isaac makes the dumbest choice he could have made and takes it off himself. Now that Isaac is at his weakest, that's Nicole's time to strike and give him his ultimatum. She snatches him up and asks him for the truth on how he feels. And Isaac has two options here. Do what Strauss did and refuse to acknowledge his mistake and keep looking for other people to solve his problem for him, or accept that he messed up and he needs to deal with it. If he chooses the first and tells Nicole that she can't do a bitch-ass thing to him, she kills him on the spot. If Isaac chooses to do the second, she completely changes and is seemingly willing to help him destroy the marker. Before we get to Ellie, some things of note here is that We find an audio log from Carrie Norton, the protagonist of the Dead Space mobile game, also known as Vandal, just before that game takes place, when she's first selected for this mission. The other thing of note is that this is right around the time we first pick up the advanced suit. This is the suit plastered all over most of the screenshots, concept art, promo art, everything. Best suit you can get in the first playthrough stat-wise, and aesthetics-wise. And you get it by opening some random ass power node door you might not have even had one for. Which would mean you completely miss out on the suit your first playthrough even though it's the one plastered over all the marketing. This is a personal pet peeve of mine when it comes to games. It should have been on the main path when you get to EarthGov or something at the least. Because if you're like me, when a game goes long enough without giving you the shit that's on the cover, you run out of patience and look up how to get it. When Isaac and Ellie link up again... Ellie has managed to find a drill. They fix it up and then drill straight into EarthGov. Ellie takes a moment to get back at Isaac for getting her eye taken out and plows through the front door with Isaac still on top. And they try to meet up in another room. Ellie has found a shuttle in another room that they can use to get out of here once they're done with the marker business, but Isaac doesn't want to risk her life. He made a mistake with Nicole and doesn't want that happening again, so he ejects her out into safety while she's checking on the ship against her will. This is also significant because this was basically his only escape route out of here. Meaning he basically just set himself up to die to get her out of here. From this point on, it's just him and Nicole. Tideman is not having any of this shit and has hella security ready to shoot Isaac on sight. Isaac is outgunned, outnumbered, and he doesn't stand a chance against all the security. So he makes the tough decision to let in the necromorph horde that's gathered outside. This trades one problem for another, 
and EarthGov is completely overrun and butchered by a never-ending legion of necromorphs. We also get a sneak peek at what is soon to be the biggest threat we'll be dealing with for this last act, the Ubermorph. If there were any civilians that were rounded up and brought here, Isaac just got some of them killed. But we're just going to gloss over that. There's also a mention of some kind of overseer that isn't happy with Tideman, who has chosen to abandon the facility and evacuate as many lives as he can in a last-ditch effort to do some good. Nothing ever comes of this overseer, by the way. What a waste of a fucking idea. When Isaac gets close to the chamber, he realizes he just caused a huge problem. This convergence thing people have been yapping about is finally explained. The markers want to create enough biomass to go critical and start consuming the area. In this case, all of EarthGov and the Sprawl. That is what they're designed to do. This creates a huge amount of power that Tideman has been after. He wanted to research this safely, but Unitology's terrorism messed that up for him. Now Isaac has made it even worse and started the convergence when the facility wasn't ready, and they weren't expecting so many bodies and organisms to trigger it. Everything has gone wrong. Isaac's only chance to stop this is to climb into the needle machine that activates the part of his brain the markers influence targets, because it allows him to understand it and how it works better. This shit right here is hands down one of the tensest things you will ever have to do in gaming history. The slightest fuck up can send the machine slamming into Isaac's eye and kill him. Every time I play Dead Space 2, I'm like, damn, this game is so good, and I don't want to put it down. And then I get here, and I dread it every time. Take moving this thing down as slow as you possibly can. Don't make any sudden moves in the red zone. Keep it in the blue or you'll pay dearly for it. Once he's done with that, it's time for the home stretch. The Ubermorph shows up and begins its attack. This is basically the hunter again. He has the same attacks, same growl, same roll, same type of a pursuer enemy, but he can't be killed officially, though he can be caused to despawn and technically die in some sort of glitch. He will chase you from now until the very last room in the game where, hilariously, he just kind of gives up and is never seen again. I'd like to say that Resident Evil should really take some fucking notes here. Their pursuer enemies started off okay, but have progressively gotten worse and worse. More annoying with every iteration, as you usually feel like you can't do anything, and any attempt to defend yourself is a waste of ammo. And you really should just be tanking hits and kiting around them, especially in Resident Evil 8 where you literally cannot damage mommy milkers here in any meaningful way. In Dead Space, you actually can fight back, and the ammo you spend in is an investment in slowing this thing down, to get some space between you and keep it away. Isaac reaches the marker room and runs into Tideman, who's burned to shit and isn't looking so good. We put him out of his misery, but of course Nicole lied. Technically, everything she's had him do can help him destroy the marker but it's also made Isaac in tune enough with the marker that he can be absorbed easily. The makers of the marker need to be absorbed fully to complete a convergence. Strauss was already so mindfucked by the marker he was easy to con and absorb, but Isaac has been one of the most resistant to it. With the marker touched parts of his brain activated, it's anyone's gamble who will take control of his mind between the two of them. So Isaac battles the marker in his mind in the form of Nicole. Shoot her enough times and she'll disappear and you can take shots at the marker in your head. This is pretty simple and legit. The hardest part will be dealing with all these annoying spams of the pack. They can do a lot of damage in a short window. If Isaac wins this fight, he destroys the marker off screen. If he gets so much as touched by Nicole at any point, that's an instant kill. The marker takes over his brain, drives him insane, and he shoots himself on the spot to be absorbed. We can assume he does the same thing if the pack kills him, but they have their own unique death animation in his mind. With the marker destroyed, Isaac is free, but he's also stranded. GovSec is falling apart around him, and there's no way out of here. He's just waiting to get hit by a falling rock or something, or bleed out from his injuries, or get blown up and die. But Ellie, being the total waifu that she is, made the hard-headed decision to come back for him, and just straight up crashes through the roof of the marker chamber. He boosts his way onto the ship and they fly the hell out of there before everything blows. 
we get a nice call back to the first game where he looks over and is relieved to see Ellie there and realizes he's finally free and the credits roll. I love Dead Space 2. This is without a doubt the best game in the trilogy. One of the greatest games ever made, a fantastic sequel, and a shining example of the action horror genre at its best. No game is perfect, but this and Resident Evil 4 are probably some of the biggest examples of how close you can get. Just writing a review for this portion of the trilogy makes me want to go replay it. In fact, that's what I plan to do just before I start writing up my takes on Dead Space 3. You also get elite versions of all the suits for a second playthrough, giving you more of a reason to come back through it. Horror games in the same series will always be less scary than the first game in it. That's embedded into the horror genre. There's nothing you can do about that. I think the only exception to this rule was probably Silent Hill 1 and 2, but that's because Silent Hill 1 is a bunch of fucking blocks and Silent Hill 2 was made in the PS2 era, so there's a whole gaming generation between the two graphically. So Dead Space, knowing that it probably can't scare everyone again, makes the most of it and plays into that as a strength trying to scare you but if it doesn't delivering a better game to play giving its players moments to remember instead of trying and failing to make the 300th slasher that you've killed try to be scary is exactly what it should have done dead space 2 will have its critics who think the first game is superior for being quote unquote scarier but that means jack shit to me when it comes to this genre scare factor will wear off by playthrough 2 no matter what horror game you're playing unless the enemy placements are randomized which doesn't work for this sort of game. So the smartest thing for games to do is to make replaying them as fun as possible. Dead Space 1, being your first experience with the franchise, is the better horror game. But Dead Space 2, being the sequel that iterates on everything the first game did, is the better game. And that, to me, is much more important than a game being scary the first time out of the dozens of times I'll replay it. Just as a quick little side note as well, just to talk about it, Dead Space 2 did have a multiplayer mode, and yes, I did used to play it back in the day, and it was pretty fun. It was Monsters vs. EarthGov, but the human characters were completely OP and hard to kill. I say that to say I fucking hate when these bigger gaming discussion channels act like nobody played a multiplayer mode while being completely full of shit. The damn game came out two years before the next generation of consoles dropped and they weren't backwards compatible initially. It's been 10 fucking years. Of course the multiplayer eventually died. That happened to a lot of these games that were left on the PS3 and 360 era's hardware. But I was still playing this and finding plenty of games well into 2014 and 2015. So don't let people who didn't play something and are just pushing their disinterest in a certain mode lie and sell a bullshit narrative to you. The game's multiplayer did fine. A bit unnecessary, but it's not like nobody played it. But now let's move on to the most divisive and controversial game in the series, Dead Space 3. If you came here to watch another run-of-the-mill Why Dead Space 3 is Terrible video, I've got some bad news for you, bud. I like Dead Space 3. I think it's actually a really good game for the type of game it wants to be. That's not to say it's not without its issues, and it for sure was definitely a step in the wrong direction because of what the game loses from 1 and 2 to make room of what it wants to do in 3, but to act like the game is horrible and one of the worst games ever made is just being over-fucking-dramatic. To set the record straight, because I don't have any desire to tiptoe around whether I like a black sheep game or not, don't give a shit about whether my opinion is in the minority or the majority because I'm not scared of getting a dislike for thinking differently. Dead Space 3 is not a bad game for packing in even more action in this time around. It's honestly arguably been that way since the beginning, since at least the halfway point in Dead Space 1, and for sure been that way since Dead Space 2. But it is, in my opinion, the worst of the trilogy as an overall package when you take into account everything that has made Dead Space great up until now into consideration. If you're a veteran player still acting like you had any hope of being scared by the 800th fucking slasher Isaac has killed, by the time of Dead Space 3 you are full of shit and you know it. Either that or you don't have a lick of goddamn common sense. This game had a one in a million chance 
of being scary to its veteran players, but it can still be a good game, and it can still be fun. Resident Evil 3 sure as shit ain't as scary as Resident Evil 1, because we've done this shit three times by now, but it is still a great fun game to play, and still a great Resident Evil game. I know that the word fun is subjective, so it bothers people like Mahler, who tries in vain to be objective even when it's literally not possible, and even his own biases towards what he feels is well-made when he writes his analysis videos is pretty apparent, but that is what it is. If being completely objective in reviews was possible, there would only ever need to be one review, one place to go to read it or watch it. And as far as I'm concerned, it takes way more balls to say you like something that a vocal part of a fan base dislikes than it does to just find another game people are beating up on and jump on it for some easy ass clicks. You shouldn't want to be a contrarian for the sake of being one, trying laughably to feel smart, but you should think for yourself and give every game its own fair shake. So I can tell you straight up when it comes to me, what you see is what you get. Unpopular opinion or not, what I think is what I think. And not in that cringy ass, brutally honest or angry review way. But I am going to give you what I personally think because trying to be some intellectual, objective reviewer is a waste of everyone's time. And no matter how hard somebody tries, they will always end up eventually giving a statement on a game that gets people worked up. You might assume that because of my attitude or vulgarity that I'm hateful or I tend to dislike things, but it's actually the opposite. I tend to like things that become popular to dislike, even without really trying to. I'm more interested in what a game does well than what it does wrong. So I go into games trying to like them, and rarely, if ever, have I played a game that I flat out thought was awful, completely irredeemable. Despite what a lot of people on this platform tend to think, a quote-unquote average game is not a bad game. Nor is it a game that you shouldn't buy or should wait for a sale on or whatever miserable ass titles these guys can come up with. Some gaming formulas and genres are more popular than others and will simply be used more like cover shooting or first person shooting. And I enjoy being able to say, oh, this game is like this other game. I'll probably like it based off of what I thought of that game. Being able to recommend games to friends based off of what they like. You are not an eight year old fucking child anymore. Stop expecting every game you buy to be different. Some special experience that'll wow you like it's your first time in Disneyland or some shit. It's great when a game does something different and it ends up working, but it's also great when developers know exactly what type of game they want to make because it's exactly the type of game they would want to play. Musicians and bands often do the same thing. If they want to make different music to what's out, that's fine. But if they hear something and go, damn, this is a good genre, I want to make that too, There's nothing wrong with that. That's how the whole fucking concept of genres got started in the first place. So that's my vow on this YouTube critique thing. To try my best to give games a fair shake and make it very clear and honest if a game really doesn't interest me because of the genre it's in. I know that I just went on a bit of a random rant here, but holy hell, I've needed to get some of this shit off my chest when it comes to this whole YouTube game critic thing. A lot of people on this platform are just clearly miserable and cherry pick whatever game people are mass hating on because it's easy for the algorithm. Or expect every game they review to be the next gaming pioneer like Resident Evil 4 and call it generic and mediocre if it isn't that and doesn't start a revolution. For the most part, as gaming generations go on and on, we've kind of figured out the formula by now. It's great and praiseworthy when a game does do something completely different and enough people enjoy it for it to take off. But when you fuck it up, it's way worse for your game than just giving people more of the same. If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it, especially in sequels. Speaking of trying to fix some shit that ain't broke, Dead Space 3. Dead Space 3's biggest issues are two things. Number one, the crafting system. Essentially gutting all your favorite weapons from the last games for something that isn't awful, but I think is worse than what we had before. And number two, it not having the balls to commit to Jack Carver and what he could offer to the single player experience too. Because it wants to straddle the lines between not pissing off the people who only want a single player Dead Space experience and giving people who wanted co-op Dead Space to blast away Necromorphs with their buddies since Dead Space 1 their own unique experience. Because of that, neither camp gets an experience that feels like it makes any sense. I feel this is the bigger flaw way worse than the ammo crafting system. 
Its biggest competition in the co-op action horror genre is obviously Resident Evil 5 and Resident Evil 6. These two games approach the co-op partner AI and involvement in single player in two different ways, with RE6's AI mechanics being a direct response to feedback from Resident Evil 5's. When we discuss the co-op, I'll talk about these games specifically and what their AI systems could do for Dead Space 3. Because honestly, whenever I play this game, this is without a doubt the biggest thing wrong with it. When Dead Space 3 starts, we flash back hundreds of years into the past in the middle of a necromorph outbreak on an icy planet. We're following Tim, and in co-op, which is considered the canon timeline due to most lines in the game often referring to there being more than just one person in a cutscene, Sam as they attempt to retrieve a codex for a man named Dr. Serrano, who wants to use it to stop whatever's going on around here. We will talk in detail about co-op very shortly when we flash forward to Isaac, but for now, just know that I'm really, really not a fan of how co-op cutscenes are done here, with the second player just kind of being a background extra. They wander around a bit before we're introduced to Dead Space 3's first new enemy type and one of my personal favorites just for how simple it looks, the Waster. Sometimes they're called the Fodder, but back when the game first came out, everyone just called them the Waster. And that's the name I know them by. They look much more like humans than the Slashers from previous games and attack with weapons like pickaxes and other sharp objects. When they take enough damage, they have a high chance of breaking in half, and when they do, Either their torso or their legs will grow lurker-like tendrils. Once we find the codex in the ship, we descend down a mountain where Sam is killed by falling debris so quickly and without emphasis that you'll probably miss it and be confused as to where he went. And without so much as a second of mourning or acknowledgement, Tim is interrupted by his commander, General Mahad, who has executed all his other fellow soldiers and kills Tim in cold blood. He wipes the Codex before offing himself and dooming the planet in an attempt to hide everything that's gone on here. We then flash forward to the future on New Horizon Lunar Colony, where things aren't going so well for our boy Isaac. He's found a new anchor in Ellie and has gone through an extreme depression after having begun a relationship with Ellie to try to get a fresh start. Things went wrong and they separated because Ellie still wanted to hunt down and stop Marcus. And Isaac, having been through enough as it is, didn't want anything to do with that. He's been through enough, and he feels like there is zero point in even trying to stop any more markers because all EarthGov and all the Unitologists do is make four more for every one he destroys. It's futile, and he's sick of it. Isaac's mental issues effectively killed their relationship. And to make matters even worse, Ellie left him a voicemail a while ago that he keeps replaying, telling him that she's found someone new and is moving on. He's at the lowest point he's possibly ever been in life after everything he's gone through. He's tracked down by our two new characters, one John Carver and Edward Norton, EarthGov soldiers who need him to help stop another marker. He initially tells them to go fuck themselves before they tell him that Ellie is the one who told them to find him. She's gone missing and without his help, they can't find him. He agrees and they set off. Here, we can finally discuss the game's co-op and its wasted potential. Because from now on, in co-op, a second player controls Carver. Dead Space 3's biggest sin is the co-op. But not because it exists. Because, like I said, they didn't have the balls to commit to it. We could talk about the fact that EA told them to make this game co-op to increase sales. But for one, that's not a bad thing. And for two, they were already trying to do that in Dead Space 1. But couldn't make it work with how tight the rooms in Dead Space 1 were so just cut out the multiplayer entirely. I could talk about how the initial plan for co-op was a Shadow Isaac that's always had their face covered so people didn't know it was Evil Isaac up until the end of the game where they turn out to be each other and turn on each other fight club style. But that too doesn't interest me. One, because we've done the whole protagonist is talking to someone who isn't really there and is just using them to turn on them thing twice already. And two, because this whole evil Isaac twist probably wouldn't have even worked well. I'll include a link to the viral Dead Space 3 the developers wanted to make video that's gone into this in much more detail. But Shadow Isaac would have only worked if the character had a different face and voice to start with. But even then, we've done this thing three times already. Isaac's talking to another person that isn't really there again. Wow. Riveting. 
This is what I mean when I say EA got greedy here. But I think snobby and stingy is more accurate. Despite what your average entitled man-child going off in the comment section would have you believe, games are really expensive to make. I'm sure you've heard that, and some of you probably don't want to accept how expensive they are to make, so the thought of EA just wanting more money is a black and white good and evil scenario here. But if you come off the entitlement for a second, you really can't blame them. Dead Space 1, from what I'm told, sold about 1 million copies and barely pushed 2 by the time Dead Space 3 started development. In that time, two feature-length movies were made as well as several books and comics. They were actually losing money on this franchise the further along they took it. So it's a bit more gray than you would think. On one hand, yes, they were losing money making these games. Unless your name is Resident Evil, horror games notoriously don't sell as well as other genres. Unless there's some low-budget niche indie title like Outlast or something. On the other hand, EA should have known that. This is exactly the same kind of thing that's happening with the Callisto Protocol as we speak. Companies make these horror games and then expect to sell, what, five, six millions like Call of Duty is in the title? Then the game realistically sells about one to two million copies and they act like, oh my god, our sales expectations haven't been met. It happens time and time and time again. So then... The publishers start meddling in the sequels and they're like, oh, well, we need to sell more copies. Let's figure out how to do that. And what they came up with is what we have in Dead Space 3. Co-op to increase sales, but co-op done the wrong way. Co-op to increase sales wasn't the mistake. Slashing the budget here so that the team couldn't actually craft a proper co-op experience, like Resident Evil 5 and 6, was the mistake. Carver is often considered a boring character by people because of how the co-op campaign treats his existence. Them trying to hop back and forth over the lines of him being included leads to cutscenes where he isn't even supposed to be present, but the game will just put him there in co-op. And other cutscenes where he is present in the cutscene, but then just disappears as soon as the cutscene is over with. Usually getting separated from Isaac through some random bridge breaking, through going on ahead with the rest of the group, or in the case that the game just can't figure out what to do with him in the single player mode, just standing around rotating like a fan you'd buy at Walmart. Carver's story as a character is actually pretty decent. He's a military man who's seen war and death, so is very hardened, and has a wife and child. He rarely ever has time for them and often forgets his son's birthday because work is always on the mind, and he's always shipped out. His biggest fear is his son growing up to want to be a soldier like him and getting killed. So he's trying to do what he can to discourage that. All this effort to support his family, keep his son safe, it's all in vain though. Because Danik ordered his family executed in retaliation before he could save them, a little while before Dead Space 3 starts. You can imagine what something like that does to an already hard soldier who's lost his whole world. And that's why he treats Isaac the way he does up until the last fourth of the game when Ellie seemingly does. Before that, Carver sees Isaac's obsession with Ellie as stupid and in the way. Carver has already lost the love of his life, so he's very bitter about Isaac constantly blabbering on and on about Ellie. Feeling like Isaac using Ellie as motivation to keep going is a stupid idea, because she can be taken away in an instant. But over the course of the game and getting to know Isaac when it looks like she actually does die, something in Carver changes and he feels bad. He starts to realize he's been flying on bitter autopilot being a soldier without really asking why he's doing what he's doing. The mission is to stop the marker so that's what he's going to do at any cost. He's a perfect partner to Isaac in this game because while Isaac is doing what he can do for the people he can save, Carver is doing this for himself, to make himself matter, for the people he's lost and to try to make amends for the stuff that he's done as a soldier, to make up for being a shitty father and to make up for being a horrible husband. There's co-op exclusive missions that have recordings you can listen to, one in particular where he's leaving his wife a goodbye note because he intends to end his life and she catches him just in time to stop him. He's done some pretty bad shit. But after something in Carver changes, when Danik holds Ellie hostage after it turns out she survived, Carver is the one who relents and gives up the codex. He never got his second chance, but Isaac has and he's about to waste it to try to stop Danik. 
We can argue about whether you'd side with Isaac to let Ellie be sacrificed for the good of stopping the marker, or whether Carver is right and that Isaac is wasting his second chance. But the bottom line is, when Carver throws Danik the Codex, it's the most selfless act he's done in his life. He did that purely for Isaac. There's a conversation him and Isaac have that's only in co-op where they argue over what Isaac would do if he lost Ellie. I like Carver as a partner character and what he brings to the story a lot more than I like most of the usual partner setups in something like Resident Evil. With the exception of Jake and Sherry, that partnership was the best thing to come from this whole co-op craze horror era thing. But for Carver and Isaac, they get along pretty well from Ellie's fake death up until the DLC, where the moons trick them into fighting each other to stall them and he's a good character with good potential, but he's done pretty dirty here with how he's implemented. I mean, the guy even has his own journal entries from his point of view for fuck's sake. I only know this because at one point the game glitches and gives you one of his journal entries even in single player by mistake. It also helps that he's got a really fucking cool looking default suit. That black and red looks tight. Also, his co-op side missions are probably one of the best things Dead Space 3 has to offer. From Isaac's perspective, Carver is going crazy. But from Carver's perspective, he's experiencing the kind of things Isaac has had to deal with forever now. So how can we fix this? Well, we can look to Resident Evil 5 and 6 for two different ways of fixing this issue. For starters, like I said, cut the bullshit and make Carver there as an AI companion at all times. Yes, this means players who didn't want co-op to be there in the first place have to take an L here. Because they aren't getting their solo horror experience. But honestly, that type of player isn't getting that even when they play solo mode as it is. Commit to having a fully AI Carver. There's two ways to go about this. The Resident Evil 5 way, where the player is responsible for Carver's health, ammo count, and etc. Some people don't like that sort of thing, but if we go this route, we get to add an extra layer of death and strategy when it comes to item management. Let's be honest here, there comes a point in playthroughs of Dead Space 1 and 2 where your inventory is just packed with ammo and health the game is giving you. With Resident Evil 5's style of inventory management, that becomes less of an issue. It also allows for the AI to use certain guns and ammo you're not using. Dead Space usually only has four weapon slots, but there's more than four weapons. This is an easy win here, and honestly, this would have been the best way to do co-op in general here, being to follow RE5's example. This also allows us to keep the dismemberment system's emphasis, which is sorely lacking in this game thanks to the weapon crafting system that we're gonna touch on a bit later, but Carver's AI can be programmed to shoot at limbs with the possibility of hitting, increasing, or decreasing depending on the difficulty. Ideally, this is without the weapon crafting system being a thing, but unfortunately it is. So this is scenario A. If weapon crafting just has to be in the game because EA has their heads up their asses and won't listen to reason, then adjust the ammo sharing system accordingly and allow us to give Carver a weapon that we can craft and make adjustments to. Scenario B works more like Resident Evil 6 since there are people who really fucking hated having to worry about Shiva's health, ammo, and all of that in Resident Evil 5. I find it less interesting to just have the AI there but never have to worry about their health or ammo at all. But for some people, Resident Evil 6's AI is just a lot more fun. I don't think this is a bad system, but like I said, some of that strategy is lost. If we're designing it this way, then you would let Carver keep his starting rifle unless another player is present and their inventory takes over. That way, we can't give him some super powered infinite ammo flamethrower or something crazy, but he's still there and he could still be useful if his starting weapon functioned like a pulse rifle that we reduce the damage on about 35%, so he's not overpowered and blowing everything away but acts more like backup and suppressing fire, so we're not getting pummeled in certain scenarios. Since he has no real health or ammo for us to worry about, we can focus on ourselves like in RE6. Now, whether or not you like Resident Evil 5 or 6, or you're one of those boring-ass people that think the game's lost their way after Code Veronica or something, is irrelevant to me. Because objectively, those games provide a more cohesive and polished idea of an AI partner that integrates into the game as a whole, better than whatever the hell Dead Space 3 is trying to do here. If you're going to give Isaac a partner, then fucking do it. And put in the work to give Carver his own perspective in cutscenes while we're at it, for fuck's sake. 
and allow us to play as him if we so choose. Again, something Resident Evil 5 and 6 all do as a no-brainer. I think either of the scenarios I just described are more desirable than what we have here. But given the choice, I'd pick scenario A, with the old weapon system from 1 and 2 still intact. Anyway, let's move back on to talking about the game we actually got here. So far, so good right now. Everything feels pretty similar to the last game as far as movement and controls. We've even still got Isaac's journal entries to read. Movement still feels fast and responsive. It's basically just like Dead Space 2 again, controls-wise. The new addition is the dodge roll. It seems like a good idea, but it's kind of botched because it doesn't actually dodge anything, and you still take the damage. Just not the hit stun. The only real difference is mechanically when it comes to the base gameplay is that the save stations have been completely removed in favor of autosave. So if you've got a life, rest assured your progress will be saved regularly. In between Dead Space 2 and 3, Unitologists and EarthGov have started another war. Unis have been led by a nutcase named Jacob Danik, who's absolutely creaming EarthGov right now. It's broken into all-out civil war by the time the game starts. The trio tries to make their escape ride while under fire from unis, but one of them suicide bombs the car and blows Isaac away, and he gets separated and needs to find a way to regroup at the roof of a nearby EarthGov building. Here's our first real taste of human enemies. For some reason, people have a meltdown over the fact that these guys exist when honestly they've been long overdue. We've had at least two different factions gunning for Isaac over the course of these games, and only now have they been introduced as an actual enemy type instead of just a set piece. This makes sense for the grand finale and really isn't that big of a problem, but holy fuck. If you listen to the way some people piss their pants when it comes to this enemy type even being included, you would think they're still in elementary school. The usual complaint is that the game becomes a quote-unquote Gears of War clone or some other stupid-ass take like Isaac is just supposed to stand there, and should he even get the idea to crouch down and get into cover so that bullets don't hit him in the face. The game has suddenly become a generic third-person shooter. The only issue I have with it because I have common sense is the fact that the game doesn't introduce the idea of unitologists and necromorphs being in the same combat arenas until like the midway point of the game. And even then, they're few and far between until the final act. That should be a way more prominent idea than what it is. An idea a game like The Last of Us has locked down. Your main three types of human enemies are assault rifle dude, who does what you think he does, shotgun dude, who does what you think he does, and grenade dude. If you've ever played a serious Sam game before, he does the whole kamikaze thing. In between that, they'll all usually throw a grenade or two to get you out of cover so that you're not getting too comfortable wherever you are, making the idea of this game being a generic cover shooter even more laughable. But you know, Dead Space 3 is a bad game because sometimes you might want to block a bullet with a solid object or something. Eventually, Isaac passes through the EarthGov HQ area and everyone's dead. They've all been cleaned out in retaliation for messing with the markers. There are marker test sites all over the city that have been set up, meaning Isaac has been right in that everything he's done has really been for nothing so far. When he takes the elevator up, he comes face to face with Danik himself, who has Isaac snatched up and forces him to watch him set off all the marker test sites all over the city, killing everyone. He narrowly escapes death by jumping into a pile of dead bodies below and passes out. When he comes to, everything has gone tits up again, and now Dead Space 3 kicks into that beautiful familiar feeling. Just you, a plasma cutter, and necromorphs all around you. Cut off the limbs to do the most damage and conserve ammo, all as well. Even writing this script, looking back at the footage for this starting area here, I'm thinking to myself, damn, look at how all this started. It feels like a proper Dead Space 3 should. It's not going to last too much longer once weapon crafting gets thrown in the mix, but for right now, we can enjoy it, can't we? With all of EarthGov here basically marker food, Isaac's next plan is to fight his way to the nearest train station. I don't know how many more times this man can make his way to a train station in one of these games, but clearly they are bad luck. Eventually, he makes his way there, and Carver and Norton pick him up in Norton's personal ship, the Eudora, just before Danik can blow up the train, and Isaac rests for a moment. Isaac tries to make friends with Carver, catching him looking at a photo of his son, 
but he's initially cold for obvious reasons. Carver doesn't know Isaac. And to him, he's just some annoying nut job asking a bunch of questions that they have to drive a galong because Ellie said so. They link up with Norton, who brings everyone up to speed on the mission. About two weeks ago, Ellie and her team shocked out, as in did the light speed drive thing in space talk, to reach a planet called Tal Volantis, the planet from the prologue. Because she thought it held info on how to stop the markers for good, but she went completely silent after that, and no one has been able to reach her. Before she went missing, she told Norton if anything happens to her to find Isaac. So he did, and now they're shocking out to her last known location, following an SOS beacon. In doing so, they fuck up and accidentally shock themselves through a minefield, which we can only assume is the same thing Ellie did. They catch a glimpse of a nearby moon, something that seems small right now, but will be very important for the story later. The ship is toast, and Isaac grabs himself an emergency spacesuit, and the rest of the crew hides in some sort of emergency cargo hold or pod or something, I can barely tell. While Isaac, Carver, and Norton guide them all to the SOS beacon in a sick-ass set piece similar to the relay ejection from the last game. I should also mention that when Isaac puts on this suit, his helmet gets blown out into space, and he fucking chases it. In space! where his head would surely be instantly fucking frozen the moment he stepped outside the ship. I mean, I'm no scientist, but I was told the space is cold as shit. We're gonna let him get away with it because it's cool, but man. Someone on this team had to look at this, program this, and go, bro, wait a damn minute. They get inside the ship the beacon is coming from, but it's pretty old and abandoned, and there's still no sign of Ellie. Norton tends to the crew, some of which are pretty badly injured, and Isaac goes deeper into the ship to look for Ellie. In doing so, he walks into a room with an old workbench and decides to make a better weapon. And we can talk about this game's second biggest mistake, the weapon crafting system. The weapon crafting system, if you take it for what it is, is a lot of fun. The way this works is you collect resources like scrap metal and then pick a frame, either large two-handed frames or a small compact one-handed frames, and you build an upper tool and lower tool. There are different types of engines that build different types of weapons, like assault rifles, rippers, force energy, and the like. You can enhance your bullets with coatings like stasis, flame, acid, and you upgrade the weapons overall using circuits you find while playing that can boost damage, clip size, fire rate, reload, everything you'd expect, and it's pretty dope. The further in the game you get, the higher the difficulties you complete, the better the circuits you can get and the best ones are usually found in New Game Plus runs. I personally keep it simple, and my primary go-to is an assault rifle upper tool and a shotgun lower tool coated in acid rounds. And let me tell you, there is no better feeling in this game than blasting away something with an acid round shotgun. The shotgun in this game feels fucking amazing. You build your own death dealers and you can create some really cool stuff. Gatling javelin guns, flamethrowers, cryothrowers on the same weapon, a giant fucking plasma cutter hybrid that rotates, an electric bullet revolver. You can make it all and for the most part, they're all pretty useful. Some weapons are better than others, but you can make and use anything you want. Once you accept the system, it's a lot of fun. The problem is accepting the system in the first place. All the guns you've come to love over the course of Dead Space 1 and 2, everything you know about their functionality, their pros and cons, their ammo economy, their upgrades, strengths and weaknesses, all erased. Now you have to build them yourself with the previously mentioned upper and lower tools to try your best to make them function like you're used to them functioning. You can find blueprints to make this a little easier, but even then, you need the resources to do so, so you're probably better off building a weapon using the tools that you found the schematics for that you already can build and just swapping them out progressively versus trying to save them up for a very specific schematic because enemies in this game are aggressive as hell. Faster, stronger, more numerous than they've ever been, and more tanky. And you will be making good use of these powerful weapons you're building, trust me. There's like three to four hunters chasing you around at one point. Also, I'm sure you've noticed by now, but you only have two weapon slots. 
You can again thank weapon crafting for that, because the upper and lower tools on each of the two frames you carry are supposed to count as your classic 4 weapon limit that the previous games had. What this means is if you're building a classic weapon from blueprints instead of building an optimal hybrid weapon, you're fucking yourself because half of your slots are gone. You know how all the marketing, all the collectibles, and even the cover of the damn game has Isaac holding his trusty plasma cutter? That thing he can always rely on whenever a new outbreak starts. The signature weapon of Dead Space. Absolutely fucking worthless. After your first 30 minutes into the game. The most iconic gun of this franchise reduced to a paperweight. Why, you say? Because like I said before, there's at least two and a half times as many enemies as you're used to. The environments are larger and they're way faster. They don't stop for shit. Your stasis is a wet fart compared to what it used to be. And this ain't the corridors of the Ishimura where they all came running down in a lunch line after you. They will circle around you and pummel you way harder than anything you've encountered in the last two games. Which wouldn't be a bad thing. It would be an absolutely great way to ramp up the stakes and make the gameplay crazier if we still had the same four weapons you could manage. And would be perfect for the AI partner again to actually fucking be there and be useful to take some of the heat off of you. But this poor plasma cutter just cannot keep up without upgrades you won't have until the late game or new game plus. And to kick this gun in the nuts even more, the rotator cuff the gun is known for that makes it versatile, that counts as the gun's lower tool. That's right, you want to use the weapon properly? Say goodbye to having a lower tool. Just describing this is painful because there's specialty frames named after previous characters. They offer special upgrades that are only applied to that specific frame. But they're specifically made for one upper tool and no lower tool. At one point I picked up one of these compact frames and I thought to myself, damn, it would be really great for a plasma cutter since it's a special frame. Oh wait, that's right, the rotator cuff is a secondary tool. So this frame is fucking worthless. And some even bigger joke here, they have a classic mode that you unlock once you beat the game that restricts you to classic weapon blueprints in an attempt to try and make the game feel like old times. The only reason to beat this mode is to try to unlock the devil horns. Because you're playing a worse version of the game in this mode. If you're used to mostly running the plasma cutter and the pulse rifle as your bread and butter in 1 and 2, you can do just fine in this mode, but you'll have it in the back of your mind that you're just missing two other fucking weapon slots. So, new weapon crafting system. How do they make it all work with all the different ammo types that every weapon has? They just fucking don't. It's all one universal ammo type now. No strategy needed, no need to check your inventory and see if you're running low on a certain gun. You should probably switch to another weapon so you don't get stuck out. Just point and shoot away. I guess this is the kind of change that had to be done so you didn't spend your resources and fuck yourself over making a gun you couldn't possibly find ammo for. But man, it is a tough spill to swallow. That's what I think about this whole system in general. Once you can get a feel for it, play for a little while and accept it and embrace it, it's extremely fun. It allows you to express yourself in your own playstyle in ways that standard weapons never could. If you lean into what the system is, it's fantastic. If you've made it this far into this video, you're well aware that I'm not afraid of addressing criticism that I think is retarded. But even I can't deny that things are lost in the shift to the weapon crafting to the point where it's a mess. Hell, you don't even really need to dismember anything. You know, another one of those key pillars this franchise has built its identity on forever now. By the time you land on Tal Volantis, you're a killing machine who doesn't even really need to aim for anything other than center mass. And is really only dismembering certain enemies because it's fun to do. Unless you're facing something like a hunter that forces you to remember that dismemberment exists. Because they don't give a shit about your raw damage. Speaking of things that don't really matter and aren't a big deal, let's touch on the microtransaction thing real quick. Because the way they've been represented and talked about by your average YouTube critic is pretty disingenuous. Because the devs did just about everything they could to ensure that if you don't want to engage with the microtransactions, you're not really pressured to. So let me break down how this shit actually works. Like I said, building and modifying weapons takes resources. Instead of credits like the previous games used, 
You're stomping the ever-living hell out of everything looking for supplies. You build yourself a good two weapons and really only swap out the upper or lower tools if you want once you build something decent that fits your style and you're good for the rest of the game. This is also how you upgrade suits for the most part now. They're mostly just cosmetic and hit points, air, kinesis, and damage are all handled through the suit kiosk since there's no weapon node bench anymore. To help you get the supplies over the course of the game, you can pick up about two scavenger bots. Back when I had this game as a teenager, I was able to get three on New Game Plus, though I think that may have changed. As you're playing and exploring, you can deploy the scavenger bot just about anywhere and he'll bring back some supplies. But if you want to optimize what you get, every now and then, when you enter certain areas, you'll hear a very distinct pinging sound which means you should equip your bot and follow the ping on its radar. When you're in the right spot, you can activate it there for best supplies. There's also a handful of side missions throughout the game that have Isaac actively looking for supplies and act like dungeons, where at the end you open up a chest and get a bunch of good loot, learn some more lore about what happened here, you know. Now it could take until the first third of the game is over, and you land on the planet for you to build something really straight up overpowered. So if you want to shortcut the process of playing the game normally, that's where the microtransactions come in. You can buy a DLC weapon or two, which can carry you through the whole game if you really want, or if you want to build something more specific, you can buy some supplies instead. You can also buy the ability to shorten the time it takes for the bots to get back to you once you deploy them. All of which are optional, and if you're playing normally, you'll barely even acknowledge that the microtransactions exist because they never really beat it across your head or flash giant text across your screen every time you pause the game to entice you to buy the DLC like Ubisoft might. Dead Space 3 is essentially made with a crafting system in mind and the microtransactions are just kind of slapped on at the end to keep EA happy, which is exactly the way they should have made it. When this game came out, I was a teenager and a senior in high school. And I didn't even have a job or the money to engage with the microtransactions, and I played the game just fine. Now, admittedly, the copy of the game I got on my PS3 was the limited edition from Walmart that came with a few bonus weapons to start, so I got what? The Witness, the Truth Pack, and the Sharpshooter Pack for free to start with. So when I rebought this game on PC, I bought those packs again for the nostalgia of having them back in 2013. But honestly, they're not that big of a deal. The main weapon I used in my first ever playthrough was essentially the one from the Witness the Truth DLC, which is just the default tip of the military engine with a unitology design, which is semi-auto and fucking sucks. And the shotgun is the lower tool with the same kind of design, which doesn't suck. Now that I'm older, I have the sense to mix up and match the two DLCs if I want to start a fresh playthrough and use the other DLC's plasma rifle upper tool and the lower tool on the shotgun from the first DLC at the same time, but that's not what I did initially. I basically only used the shotgun until I had the resources to build an automatic upper tool. So essentially, I just ended up with a shotgun 15 minutes earlier than I would have got it if I had absolutely no DLC. Big whoop. The game played fine. Like I said before, plenty of other horror games today have DLC weapons that are stronger than the starting guns or the main guns and give you a bit of a head start. Resident Evil 2's remake has the same kind of shit with its samurai edges. That's how the weapons should be if you're paying extra money for them. Or I guess you can do what Resident Evil 8 does and waste your money with a DLC that can't be upgraded and will be worthless to you 5 minutes within handing it to you. Since the default pistol gets an upgrade damn near immediately, making what you just bought worthless. So no, the microtransactions aren't really that big of a deal. They don't flash it across your damn character's forehead and you can play the game just fine not making a single purchase. The narrative that this game somehow sabotages itself by allowing you to bypass the intended progression if you want to do so is just bullshit. Them simply existing in a game is not really a problem. Have some goddamn self-control. If you want to skip the grind, do so. If you don't, and you don't want to spend the extra money, don't spend the extra money. This is honestly one of the most non-issue ways of doing microtransactions possible. Believe you me, there have been way worse examples 
and yet some people act like they've been personally attacked by the idea that this game even offers a shortcut to people who might want to pay for it. As if Dead Space 1 and 2 didn't have DLC weapons that were stronger than the base guns. Now, we've discussed the two biggest issues with Dead Space 3 in my opinion. And without a doubt, between the two of them, the weapon crafting is the most offensive and the weakest addition thanks to what we lost to make it work. But co-op is by far the worst. Not for the reason you think though, let me explain. Weapon crafting was always doomed to fail and pale in comparison to the dedicated and detailed weapons we had had before, with all the cool lore and unique designs. That was always going to be a mistake, but co-op is disappointing in the fact that it really could have been something if they put love and care into it. That's what makes it the worst, because there could have been something here. Isaac was alone for what, two games in a row? Here he's not, even with Carver not there. He has people watching his back. And by the end of the game, he and Carver are looking out for each other. But it's not fleshed out enough. Part of this could have been the lower budget they were given, but I fully believe even with that, if they had focused and doubled down on co-op and cut out the weapon crafting entirely, just using that time for a better experience with AI, we could have received a way better game than what we got. Even if it came at the expense of the inevitable tantrum that Pyrrhus would have thrown about not having a fully single player Dead Space 3. After we make our first weapon, Isaac searches about the ship and it isn't long before he realizes the crew around here haven't gone anywhere. They've just all been infected and transformed. It's been so long, the corruption has run out of organic matter, and all the necromorphs have gone into a hibernation potting for hundreds of years until it's time to kill again. Because of that, all the enemies of the game have been mostly redesigned to appear more rotten and decayed than the enemies we're used to seeing. And since we're dealing with soldiers, lurkers that are usually made from babies have been replaced with ones made from dogs. While searching around, Isaac also finds a way to get the ship power up and running. And Norton and him meet up at Ellie's location where Isaac is blindsided by Ellie and Norton actually being together. He is rightfully taken back by this and pretty pissed off. He tells her it was a pretty fucked up move to move on that quick from him and it's funny because she will have this exact same fucking problem later on. He also meets the rest of the crew here, Buckle and Santos. The plan now is to make our way to the Admiral's quarters because Ellie believes the Admiral knew something about the markers and how to stop them. The Admiral has written and marker symbols all over her room, but since Ellie isn't marker touch, she can't read them. That's what they need Isaac for. When Isaac and Carver get there, and Isaac reads what's been written, it turns out the Admiral was obsessed with making a key and turning off some kind of machine on the planet down below. That's what she's written on the wall over and over. She's had a lot of time to write this all over the place, and she was locked inside her quarters to die for some reason, possibly due to the ship's power outage. But some other doors were openable, so who knows. This is another instance of Isaac trusting the word of something that's clearly been influenced by markers that will come back to bite him later on in the ass in the game. The rest of the crew has found two things. A skiff to help them move around the fleet of ships, acting like a sort of space train, and a larger shuttle called the Crozier? Or was it Crozer? Listen, it's a fucking spaceship. They can use it to get out of here if they can find it and fix it up with some spare parts. The problem is the crew is split on wanting to use the shuttle to head back home and wanting to use it to travel to the planet down below and look for the markers. With Ellie being the main one wanting to head to Volantis and Norton wanting to head back. He's also growing sick of Isaac and Ellie being around each other, especially after Isaac takes Ellie's side. Which I guess the audience is supposed to dislike Norton for, but honestly, based on how Ellie acts and will act later in the game, I don't blame him. He has a bit of a point. Though it is weird for him to contact Isaac privately to see if he's on his side. Of course he's not on your side, dude. That's his ex. On our way out, we pass by our first suit kiosk, which is a perfect time to talk about what I think of the suits themselves. Dead Space 3, without a doubt, probably has the most consistent looking suits of the three games, minus the ugly ass EVA suit you're kind of stuck with for the first third of the game. Once you get to the planet and start getting the Arctic suits, just about all of them look good. I still prefer the default Arctic suit that's used in all the promotional material because it still has Isaac's iconic three eye slits that have become his trademark in every game. 
but the other suits follow a similar design as far as bodywork goes. Carver's suits outside of his default suit are mostly just mirrors of Isaac's suits, but rearranged in order. As I mentioned earlier, to my knowledge, the suits themselves are completely cosmetics now. Things like armor, hit points, stasis, everything, it's all handled through the upgrades at the kiosk itself. This is a good change to me, as you can upgrade your suit as early or as late as you want and still have it look however you want. On the game's completion, Isaac gets his old engineer rig back, and Carver gets the security suit. If you have a Mass Effect 3 save file, you get the N7 suit. But I'm guessing this would be the original release of Mass Effect 3 and not the new Legendary Edition, so good luck with that one in this day and age. That game's original release, by itself, costs more than the remastered Legendary Edition on Steam, which is fucking insane. There is one suit missing, which I consider to be an absolute betrayal. In early reveals for Dead Space 3, Isaac can be seen wearing the advanced suit instead of the EVA suit he gets at the start of the game. It was supposed to be the one that gets damaged, malfunctioned, and needed to be changed out when he gets to Tal Vilantis. I think this is a much better idea. All the files for it are even still in the game, they just can't be accessed by normal means. It's a shame they changed this because honestly I'd put the EVA suit right up there with the vintage suit as one of the ugliest suits this franchise has, and you're stuck with it for a third of the game. Back on track, this is where we can do one of our first side missions, and it's probably one of the more important ones along with the deep dive team side mission, and all of Carver's side missions. It really just boils down to them decrypting a message the scientists in the fleet sent down to the ones on the planet telling them to hide Rosetta, so that their research wouldn't be destroyed when the soldiers were ordered to scrub everything. On another side note, let's give some praise real quick to how good the game looks. This was released in 2013, which is on the sunset of the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 era, where this hardware was easily pushed to its limits. So this game in particular looks really good even when compared to Dead Space 1 and 2. And this era in games is something that tends to look incredible at higher resolutions. The downside is that riding around and stuff like the skiff is all pre-rendered. Something that was surely a good idea at the time to save memory and resources, but as the game has aged, it looks pretty bad when uprest. Back as a teenager on appropriate hardware though, it was something that wasn't really noticeable. To get to the shuttle, Isaac needs to head to a bigger ship called the Terra Nova, which the shuttle is located in. This ship is a bit of a throwback to the Ishimura in that Isaac will be using some sort of tram to take him to different stations around said ship. Said tram is currently blocked by something, as always, so we head over to the cargo area of the ship to clear the obstructions. Doing that, we get a quick look at what is bound to be our biggest threat for the next hour or so. Another thing worth noting is that in this game, swarmers and infectors have been combined into one necromorph type that serves both purposes and usually makes wasters. Pregnants, as a result, have been updated to carry this necromorph type and also have updated animations making them way harder to hit without hitting their gut now. When we circle back to the tram, we run into the regenerators. These guys look like the designs of the Ubermorph and Hunter fused into one. They have Ubermorph eyes, but Hunter build. And as an extra fuck you, you will be dealing with several at a time in addition to whatever else is in the room. And surprise, surprise, this is all still way less infuriating than any pursuer enemy in Resident Evil. Because again, you have a reason to actually fucking shoot them and slow them down. I also love Isaac's- Ah oh, shit! I'm really hoping he reacts to not being able to kill the Hunter in Dead Space 1's remake or something. A simple confused what the fuck. The first time the Hunter regenerates would be all that's needed. Something that gives Isaac a genuine reaction. Because when the Ubermorph showed up in 2, there wasn't really a reaction out of him. They missed the opportunity to have him say something like, you know, ah, not this shit again. Or just something that lets us know that he's familiar with what is going on right now. These guys and their lore is a bit interesting. From what I understand of it, these are the deep dig teams sent into marker sites on the planet below. And they've all gone insane from being so close to the marker signals. In what is basically a marker city. Because of that, their mutations are special. They've scribbled marker jargon all over their bodies and their skins have turned dark, and they're buff as shit. They look like the goddamn health inspector from the boondocks. Over time, their bodies have changed into this, and they're practically unkillable. 
outside of severe anti-tank weaponry. That cute little engine trick Isaac pulled the first time around ain't working on these things, they just brush that off. This ship, because of how big it is, is where they were dumped, while the crew tried to figure out what was wrong with them. Some of them transformed here, while others never made it out of the dig site. Isaac barely escapes them through the tram system. We can do another optional side mission, learning some lore about what happened to the crew on this particular ship, and then we reach the station where the shuttle is located, where they catch up with us again. The crow's ear, once Isaac sees it, is a piece of shit, so he needs to search around for the parts to build a remote relay and refuel the engines. In doing that, Ellie accidentally starts the goddamn launch sequence, and Isaac needs to scramble to get out of there before he gets roasted. Quick side note, I have no idea what the hell happened here, but one of these things glitched out and was basically invincible, and legit just blew me out. Didn't stand a chance. Something gets caught on the airlock door's gears, because of course, and Isaac needs to head over and run cleanup duty. All the military ordnance this ship was transporting is getting caught in the gears and is stuck. Isaac uses the machine guns nearby to wipe out all the regenerators and blow things clear. You would think blowing up explosives near the gears would break them and make the airlock door stuck in position, but I guess not. There's two last parts they need before they can take off. A flight recorder so they know where to go and how to enter the planet's atmosphere safely, and a port engine. They decide to salvage the engine from a nearby ship, and Isaac links up with Rosen, who's clearly on Norton's side and just wants to go home. After everything is up and running, the crew outvotes Norton to take the shuttle down to the planet's surface and turn the machine off. Isaac climbs aboard, completely brushes off Ellie since he's rightfully pissed about the whole Norton thing, and they take off. This is just me talking from my personal life here, but Isaac reacts perfectly to this. Don't try to be fucking all smiles and sunshine with me after you've left me and have a new boyfriend. Get the fuck out of my face. We get a brief flight section where we need to stay on the flight recorder's path as Isaac or shoot out debris from the way as Carver. So that we don't fuck up and die, but it doesn't really matter because we're scripted for the flight to go bad and for us to hit rocks anyway. Rosen and whoever the hell this other chick was are killed. The ship breaks apart, separating Isaac and Carver from the rest of the group, and when he comes to from the crash, his suit is malfunctioning, so he's in danger of hypothermia. This is extra funny to me now that I think about it, considering, like I said earlier, the man flew directly out of a ship into space with no helmet on, and his head wasn't instantly frozen solid out there. But here, they actually care about the detail of his helmet working. Man, video game writing is so funny. In single player, this will be Isaac mostly searching by himself, and then Carver will eventually see him from a balcony and speak to him. In co-op, Carver is here the whole time telling Isaac to keep it the fuck down before he gets the both of them killed by whatever's out here and stalking them, and that Ellie is likely dead. He even stops him at one point to grill him about his obsession with Ellie possibly jeopardizing the mission. This is probably the only time I think this separate experiences thing this game wants to play with actually works somewhat. Most of the time, it flops. There's still moment here that look ridiculous, like Carver literally flying into view randomly like a piece of paper that slipped out of your hand in the wind when the snow beast attacks. But this is also one of the only times to my knowledge that Carver actually gets his own perspective. In the construction QTE, he has his own set of prompts and will try to help Isaac get out of the crane. You can tell they put extra care into this specific part of the game because it's the one they showed off when the game was revealed. They wanted it to look good, but it's like they either ran out of time or budget for the rest of the game and gave Carver and Player 2 basically nothing. Here's a thought. Instead of doubling the amount of money you need to spend on your studio time by having actors repeat the same exact lines with only slight variations for co-op, just flesh out the co-op. Design AI so that you only have to use the line once. Right now, we're searching for the rest of the crew. Isaac finds the other half of the ship and almost has a heart attack when he's sees a dead body thinking it's Ellie, only for it to turn out to be Rosen's dead ass. We also find in the log, Ellie leaves telling him and Carver to follow the flares to find them, so that's what Isaac does. Part way through, we get attacked by the snow beast a couple of times, who seems to be stalking us before we run into a door we can't pass through because of our suit integrity. Searching nearby, we actually run into Buckle, who's damn near an ice cube. He explains that they found suits to survive the cold, but there weren't enough to go around. 
He thinks there could be some more downstairs, but he heard weird shit going on down there, and he'd rather die here than die down there trying to figure out whatever it is. We power up the elevator and take a look for ourselves. This part of the game as well as a nearby side mission tells the story of Sam Ackerman, the second player character during the prologue before he ended up there. Essentially what happened is some idiot lame Bloomy fucked up and spoiled all the rations and the food for this division at least. Not sure about the whole fleet. The platoon gets desperate and starts eating the infected necromorph flesh from their experiments. This was clearly a bad idea and Sam was one of the only ones that didn't partake. It drove them crazy and eventually changed them into this new infected type, the feeders. They're the replacement for the pack since again there's no children around. The twist on these guys is that they are way more dangerous than the pack, but a lot of times these guys can be avoided entirely. They're like liquors from Resident Evil, only instead of sound, it's light that really pisses them off. I wouldn't sprint around them either, but just keep your flashlight to yourself and kite around them and in general you'll be okay. After Isaac finds a new suit, we continue our search for Ellie. When we catch up to the group, either of the split scenarios I mentioned earlier happen and Isaac powers up the elevator to regroup with everyone after letting them know he's okay, much to Norton's annoyance. But before he gets to the top, the beast that's been stalking him from before shows up and makes his real move. It's time for a boss fight. It goes about how you expect. It's a giant crab monster. You shoot the yellow spots on its legs and then the ones on its face until it dies, or in this case, runs away. The most dangerous attack it has is trying to charge and ram you. Once you deal enough damage, it'll run away and we can make our way to the rest of the group. Things get a bit heated in the love triangle when Ellie decides to get all touchy-feely on Isaac directly in front of Norton, which obviously pisses him off, and an argument between the two breaks off, before Ellie breaks it up. Since all the computer data was destroyed during the whole deep cleanse thing, Santos searches through the written logs, which talk about an experience on an alien that can reveal the location of Rosetta and the machine at the other end of the complex. They all head that way, but of course Isaac gets separated again by an ambush from Danik's men, who have somehow tracked them to this planet. Everyone is baffled as to how this happened. But from this point on, Danik's men will be thrown into the mix with Necromorphs' enemies, while they try to stop Isaac from turning on the machine. If I'm honest, at this point Isaac constantly linking up with someone over the course of this series just to get blown away by some kind of explosion is starting to get ridiculous. The man has to have some kind of brain damage and organ issues from all of this. I'm honestly surprised he's still alive, and I don't mean from the necromorphs. Isaac runs into a new necromorph type that is technically just an old one remixed in the divider heads from the previous game, only now they can attach themselves to the heads of Danik's men and clumsily attempt to fire their weapons at Isaac, similar to the, some of those zombies from Resident Evil 6. Other than that, they mostly act like the old divider heads when they're not attached to something. Another section of note is the drill here that's blocking our way into the warehouse the rest of the gang is in. It's one of the coolest moments in the game. Increasingly difficult necromorphs drop in while you try to deal with this goddamn drill spinning about and try to destroy it. When Isaac makes his inside, the group goes over the plan. The scientists were experimenting on this big beast called the Nexus. It's a conduit for the machine signal or something bouncing back the signal to smaller creatures. Listen, this science mumbo-jumbo is getting confusing. The point is, we need to open up and probe it to catch the signal for the machine. We need to thaw it out by turning off the heater first and then look for the parts to build a probe gun at another research warehouse somewhere else in the camp. We run into our old friends, the stalkers again, as well as passing by a room with a briefing for the sovereign colonies, detailing the protocol for the mission going wrong and the operation to kill all the scientists wipe all the research, and the self-termination protocol. Speaking of self-terminating, some of Danik's men are starting to lose it and off themselves too to do the whole, you know, ascension thing. We get the parts to make the probe, and the damn snow beast is back for round two. We head back to the group and Isaac turns a corner just in time to see Norton sneaking and talking to someone over the intercom. Or it could be Carver, depending on who turns the corner first. We open up the creature and Norton gets put in charge of lowering us inside it to probe its nerves for the signal. This is also when enhanced feeders get introduced because this creature's insides are swarming with these things. When we're done, Norton pulls us up and waits for the others to leave the room before locking us inside the cage and leaving us there. Now Isaac, I can understand him leaving, but what the hell has Carver done to him? He also locks two dudes with kinesis modules in a cage with a lever that is manually turned because he's an idiot. 
The only smart thing he does is try to jam Isaac's communication to Ellie. When Isaac walks outside, he's ambushed by Danik and his men, who holds him, Carver, and Norton at gunpoint. See, Norton, sick of Isaac's bullshit, turned and sold out the group's location to Danik under a deal that Danik would let them all go home if he got Isaac. That's who Norton was talking to when Isaac caught him on the balcony. Speaking of which, the devs had attention to detail to add this moment, but didn't have the attention to detail to realize they placed Santos right fucking behind Norton when he's supposedly calling Danik. So realistically, she would have heard everything. Of course, this was a goddamn lie, and Norton is a retard for thinking a religious terrorist would uphold his end of a deal with no obligation or pressure to do so. Then we get what is probably the funniest way out of a hostage situation in video game history, where Isaac just straight up tackles Danik to the ground in front of all his heavily armed men, who do absolutely nothing to stop it, besides lightly grabbing him, giving Carver the time he needs to kill a guard somehow from the kneeling position, kill another one, and then Isaac throws a grenade at Danik who's just been standing around for like 15 seconds. Danik runs away and escapes to his vertebrate, and the group pick their guns back up. Mid-combat with Danik's men, the Nexus creature has woken up from the thawing and the probing, and he is not happy about it, and we get our second boss fight of the game. This boss fight is cool, but is also a prime example of the co-op issue I keep complaining about. The game acts like Carver is here during this fight. He gets sucked out at the start of it right beside Isaac. He talks like he's fighting right beside Isaac. But in single player, Carver just isn't on screen. I cannot express enough how fucking whack the way they did this is. As far as the boss fight itself goes, there really isn't much else to explain. You remember the hive mind fight, right? You basically just do that again with a little remixing. At one point, you run out of yellow spots to shoot. It'll eat you up with nothing you can do about it. And then you kill a few old zero G enemies from Dead Space 2 in its stomach. And that's what kills it. It throws up and spits you out. Norton loses it and tries to kill Isaac right in front of Carver like a moron. Listen, I'm not even saying I wouldn't do what Norton is trying to do or feel what Norton is feeling here. Because I would. But he's going about executing his plan in the worst way possible. His only way out of this now without alerting Ellie to what he's done would be to kill both Carver and Isaac. But he insists on trying to keep Carver alive. This is after his first plan to just hand over Isaac to Danik failed. Where he expected Ellie to just be okay with him doing that. He could just prance back home in one of Danik's ships or something. And nobody would ask any questions. His emotions here are valid. His dumbass plan is not. Isaac is forced to give him some aspirin for his migraine and panics because he just shot Ellie's new boyfriend. He also remembers to yank his photo back from Norton's worthless cuck body. When Isaac and Carver catch back up to Ellie and explain the situation, it doesn't go over well. Ellie has a fit over it and refuses to talk to Isaac. It doesn't fucking help that when Isaac explains that Norton is dead, he does it in the worst way possible with zero context for what happened and just says he shot him. Carver has to explain that Norton sold them out. They all start having meltdowns, and Giga Chad Carver is like, if you motherfuckers can't hold it together, you're getting left behind. After that, they break it up. Isaac climbs up the nearby mountain to try to find a lift for them to use, since trying to climb it back to back is dangerous and could start an avalanche. Now, I want you to keep in mind how Ellie is acting here for when I lay into her later. Isaac tries to defend what he did because Norton... Pointed a fucking gun at his face. And Ellie's like, I'm sorry. Is that supposed to make it okay? Uh, yes. The fuck am I supposed to do? Just die because killing your new boyfriend might hurt your feelings? Fuck that guy. The next bit of the game is just Isaac exploring the caves in the mountain looking for a way to let them up. And since we have some dead time to kill here, please allow me to rant about how EA's Origin Launcher is one of the worst fucking pieces of garbage ever coded. Now, I really don't care about games having all these launchers and whatnot, honestly, on PC. A couple of years ago, I used to really dislike all these launchers, but really, I've stopped caring about all that shit over time. It is what it is, as long as they tend to work, that is. The problem with Origins Launcher is that most of the time, it straight up doesn't work. Back when Dead Space 3 was Origin exclusive, I bought this whole trilogy on Origin as well as Crisis and Mass Effect. If I had a dollar 
for every time this garbage ass launcher didn't work, I could afford to buy out EA and fire everyone who conceptualized and forced their programmers to design it. Then I'd personally seek out and fire everyone who decided we didn't need a Star Wars Force Unleashed 3. Origin got so bad I couldn't even launch Dead Space 1 and 2 after I reinstalled Windows earlier this year. They just straight up wouldn't work. You would think this wouldn't matter too much now that EA has given up on Origin and shut it down completely as of the time of writing this, as well as adding most of their catalog back to Steam, and believe me, even though all of your purchases still work right now, I rush to buy the Dead Space trilogy again on Steam. Where, what do you know, magically those versions of Dead Space 1 and 2 launch just fine, but Dead Space 3 still requires Origin to launch properly. And since Origin barely launches properly, that means Dead Space 3 barely launches properly. You usually have to click on this game for Origin to try to launch. Then you force close Origin's attempt to launch that more than likely failed. And then you have to try to launch Dead Space 3 again where it might actually launch properly. That's just another issue when it comes to this game that it really doesn't fucking need. Eventually, Isaac and Carver find a way to let the rest of the group back up. Santos starts whining because she's afraid of heights as if that's the worst way to die rather than getting eaten alive by an alien parasite looking to use you as a string puppet or something. But she turns out to be right, as when she, the lift gets up, the snow beast attacks again before Santos can get off, and Isaac almost gets himself killed trying to save her. Carver cuts the line trying to avoid the cliff breaking, but thanks to Isaac being hard-headed, it breaks on them anyway. He and Carver battle the snow beast. This time we're here to kill it for good. We need to power up the harpoon guns, and then lure it into their line of fire to pull it apart. If you know what you're doing, this fight can be over within a minute tops. Maybe even shorter. I'm sure this kind of boss design where the game tells you what you should be trying to do to kill the boss is a pet peeve of certain kinds of gamers, but I'm not one of them. I'll take games giving me a hint rather than throwing me in the deep end of the water and telling you tough tits figure it out while wasting all your resources like the hunter fights from the first game did any day of the week. When Isaac and Carver make it back to Ellie, Isaac breaks down and apologizes to her for failing their relationship, giving up on their fight to stop the markers and being how he's been towards her, and they reconnect their relationship. This is my biggest problem with Ellie in this game. She's kind of a thought. Norton's been dead a total of what, 30 fucking minutes? And all Isaac does is say, basically say, I'm sorry, and she's ready to use him like a human trampoline again. Which would be fine if she hadn't just pouted and moped about Norton before this. If Isaac died, I wouldn't be surprised if Carver was the next on the train. Dead Space has actually had this problem with Lexine too, from Extraction. She basically just jumped from three men over the course of one game. Compare that to Isaac, who spent an entire game going through a whole grieving process before he moved on. I'm just saying. They make it to the research facility with Danik hot on their asses, and looking through the notes, they find out Rosetta is an alien that was home to this planet that has been cut into pieces and scattered across the facility in an attempt to hide her from the SC cleansing order. Isaac and Carver head off to look for said pieces. I love the back and forth between Isaac and Carver here when it comes to trying to use the corrosive gas to clean up the infection around it. Another cool side mission here is the... 163rd Special Unit. Essentially, this was the Sovereign Colony's version of the Umbrella Stars unit from Resident Evil. They were the best of the best. But they make the mistake of fucking with the wrong person and hazing them, telling them if he just endures it and holds out, they're gonna let him join them. Of course, they never had any intention of doing that, so he snaps and cuts every single one of their heads off in their sleep. These heads are littered about the whole level and will attack you now that they're infected. I like this side mission in particular because what happened here really had nothing to do with the necromorph outbreak. It was just them messing with the wrong guy and finding out the hard way. Another interesting bit of lore here is that the Sovereign Colonies were looking to study the markers because they were at war with Separatists. When this whole plan went downhill, the Sovereign Colonies lost the war and were eventually beaten and wiped out. The Separatists eventually took over and became the EarthGov that we know from the last two games. This is also around the time when the Twitchers make their comeback. I've missed these guys. It felt really weird for them to basically 
be completely missing from the last game outside of the DLC, especially because all of the EarthGov soldiers around seemed like they would have stasis units on their rigs. Gabe did, but it's good that they're back here. They move a bit differently, and we'll try their low profile your shots, as well as zigzag. We put Rosetta together and use her to assemble the codex, before Isaac has another brain fart and realizes that unsurprisingly, the markers tricked everyone again. Rosetta and the other life forms that lived here built a machine to freeze the planet in a last attempt to stop the planet halfway through a convergence event. It was being devoured by the moon that is right beside it. The markers have been trying to trick everyone into turning the machine off, and like a bunch of dumbasses, they fell for it again. Unfortunately for Isaac, he just spoke out loud and Danik has heard everything. Danik takes the codex and Isaac sets off another decontamination gassing so they can escape. Ellie gets trapped and can't make the jump and supposedly dies and he breaks down. Carver reminds him that they still have a job to do and they chase Danik and his men into the city and lay eyes on the machine from afar. Eventually catching up to him long enough to steal the codex back off him and then fall down further into Markerville. Reanimated aliens from this point on will act as brutes from Dead Space 1 and 2. There's one last side mission we can do here that gives us a more lore on the deep dive team that turned into regenerators. A lot of which are still down here, but other than that, we're trying to get to the machine and reconfigure it using the codex to destroy the markers here. Destroy the planet and stop convergence. This is what the aliens were working on, but ran out of time and just rage quit and froze everything. While running about and doing our thing, getting everything ready, Danik radios Isaac to tell him that he has Ellie, who barely survived by jumping into a nearby vent. He'll be waiting at the machine for him. When everything is ready, we find Serrano at the bottom of the machine, who died from injuries while waiting for Tim and Sam to return with a codex. We get what is possibly the most annoying climbing section in the game and come face to face with Danik. He threatens to kill Ellie if they don't give him the codex, of course, and while Isaac refuses to give it to him, Carver pulls a Carver, says fuck that, and trades Ellie for the machine. Danik reactivates the machine and gets crushed, and Isaac says goodbye to Ellie before she takes a ship to escape, knowing that destroying the planet means anyone still here will die. Before he and Carver can reach the machine, they get blown away from it and have to chase after it, while the moon is consuming the planet. When they finally make it there, we reach the final battle against the heart of the Brother Moon. Grab the markers, launch them into the eyes, shoot the tentacles when it tries to grab you, and kill the boss adds when they spawn. When you bring it down, Isaac and Carver come to terms with their deaths, and then set the machine to destroy everything. Isaac takes one good look at his photo of Ellie one last time, before seemingly dying in the vortex with Carver. Ellie floats alone in space, trying to radio them, realizing that the marker signal is gone and the moon has stopped before finally accepting they've died and leaving for Earth. We hear Isaac's voice call out to Ellie, implying him and Carver might still be alive as a little bit of fan service, and then the credits roll. But that's not the end of the story here. We have to discuss the Aftermath DLC. The Aftermath DLC here gives me conflicting opinions, because from a gameplay perspective, I like the experience it provides. Instead of being up against some giant hulking monster for the big bad, like you usually are, Isaac and Carver are actually up against another human whose connection to the marker signal is strong. He's able to fuck with their minds on command and is extremely powerful and an interesting premise that works. But in order for this DLC to exist the way it does, they basically had to just gloss right over the fact that they died and a huge chunk of this planet had to be destroyed by a whole ass moon crashing into it. I wish I was bullshitting or exaggerating, but no, they just gloss over it like it never happened. Isaac's helmet that got damaged and his injuries... Completely healed. Not a peep about it. And it's not even mentioning the weird intro where they both wake up in a hallucinated apartment that they seem to both be seen. Or the fact that the pack are back in this DLC, but there are no children around since this is a military base. It's all weird, but it is canon. And no to that guy in the comments sections. Because there always is at least one, I don't give a shit about your headcanon that tries to act like this DLC is 
So the boys come up with a plan here, now that they're undead, and try to find one of Danik's ships and head back to Earth. Up top, they find the moon they killed on the planet. Really, if a moon just straight crashes into a planet, I don't think that planet would still be a thing anymore. But we gotta just look past that. Isaac starts to question whether or not this is what necromorphs feel like when they're reanimated by the marker. While looking for a ship, it becomes very clear that maybe they didn't finish the markers off after all, because they start hallucinating again. Isaac runs into Norton's dead body alive as a necromorph and realizes the markers are still active and the planet is still infested with them. Stopping this moon did jack shit, because it called its brothers anyway and they're headed for Earth. They have to get back and try to warn them. Even worse is, again, somebody from Danik's followers, like I mentioned, has taken over and the Markans are communicating with him to try to get him to lead them back to Earth. He's also used as a vessel for the Markers to speak directly to Isaac through. Whenever he's around, he will pursue Isaac and Carver from time to time through certain areas and your only option is to avoid him when you're locked in a room, since he's completely invincible. The duo find themselves a ship, but run into another issue. The shock point drive on this woman is damaged and can only take them out to the fleet up above the planet, the one that they found Ellie's distress signal at. So they're going to have to try to find another way back to Earth from up there. This, as luck would have it, is where all Danik's men are headed back to. As we can see, they've completely fucking lost it. They're chopping off their hands and using them as offerings to the Brothers Moon and replacing the nubs with sharp objects to look more like necromorphs. They've also taken out their eyes. This is actually a really cool idea for an enemy type, and I'm surprised Dead Space is only just now thinking about this as an idea. As we explore the Terra Nova once more and grab the shock point drive, Isaac and Carver start to argue over whether or not the markers might be trying to trick them into leading them back to Earth. Isaac wants to destroy the drive so that they can't get back, but Carver thinks Isaac has lost his goddamn mind again. And this leads to a boss fight with each other that's only broken up by the new uni leader basically deciding to make his move and try to kill the both of them. This fight against him is very similar to the fight against Nicole from Dead Space 2. Stay away from him until a marker starts to glow and destroy it. Then you can damage him. Once you bring him down, the moons will tell you that this was all a distraction to keep you from warning Earth before they could arrive. They already knew Earth's location and Carver was right. They fix the reactor, slot in the shock point, and rush to warn Earth, but when they arrive, they're too late. The moons are already here and have started a full-scale planetary necromorph invasion. And they crash directly into one of the moons. Fuck, man. Dead Space has been left on this cliffhanger for what? Almost 10 years now? How Half-Life fans feel about Half-Life Episode 3 is how I feel about Dead Space 4. This DLC overall, if you're okay with the gigantic plot hole it starts with, is a great experience, and I like some of the stuff it does better than the base game. I like the villain here way more than Danik, and I think personally someone with this strong of a marker's influence was a mistake to kill here. They could have really set up a good recurring protagonist for the franchise, but it is what it is. Other than him, I like the DLC, but I think knowing the Lampo this franchise has been in, I'd say it really didn't need to exist. If the franchise had ended with just the base game, we could at least say, hey, Dead Space 4 didn't happen, but Isaac did it. He saved Ellie, he saved Earth, and he died a hero. But with this DLC, we know he failed. Earth is being overrun. We don't know where Ellie is. We don't know what happened to Isaac and Carver after they crashed here, none of that. There's some ideas floating around the web of what they wanted to do next involving Earth being overrun and Ellie needing to scavenge supplies from ships around space, and that just doesn't sound appealing to me. I came here for Dead Space, not Daisy. As for Dead Space 3 as a whole, I like this game, I really do. It is flawed. I feel it was developed the wrong kind of way when it came to how they did co-op, but a lot of what Dead Space is about is still here from the lore and themes perspective. But it is without a doubt the weakest entry in this series. That being said, this clickbait ass narrative that Dead Space 3 is so bad it killed the franchise is complete horseshit. Whether it was good or bad, EA just wanted this kind of game to sell way too much money. 
Dead Space 3 still brought in a pretty penny, but EA had their head up their ass and was greedy with the amount of money they wanted to make from this IP. So they just shut it all down after this. And that is a real shame because I love Dead Space. Right up there with Resident Evil, to me, they trade blows for who is the better franchise. And Dead Space is able to do that with just two games mostly. With Dead Space 3, they made some mistakes, but sometimes the only way you learn not to do some shit is to do it and find out it didn't really work out. And learn from it later. And that's what Dead Space 4 could have been. And with that, I've covered this entire trilogy. Unfortunately, this was supposed to be out by the time the Callisto Protocol launched. But this will probably be uploaded afterwards simply because that game is getting pummeled by some fair criticism, but also a lot of absolute idiots right now. And I want to put my two cents out there while the game is still fresh. We've also seen new screenshots and footage of the Dead Space remake, and it's looking like everything it should be. I can't wait to play it. I have a special comparison between the Dead Space remake and the Resident Evil 4 remake plan to see how they differ in trying to remake the same type of game. So while I will stream and upload a playthrough of the remake as per usual, expect an actual review and analysis to be a bit late, as it'll need to be after the remake of Resident Evil 4 launches so I can compare and contrast the two. This video has been a long one, and I got a week until Dead Space Remake launches, so I'm having to crunch the shit out of this to get it out. But I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll catch you around.